Shalom and welcome everybody to the Unexpected Cosmology classes and session. As of today, I am back in YouTube jail again. So I'm not sure when this video is going to ever go up. Last time I was in YouTube jail, it lasted for, I feel like almost a month. It was a long time. And uh, I don't know, at this rate, I'm not going to survive through the, the end of the year. So there are certain key words that apparently I cannot say. And it makes me want to say it all that much more and all that much harder. Uh, it just makes me <laughs> want to say those words repeatedly over and over again. But YouTube uh, is not allowing it. So I'm not sure when this video will get uploaded. Um, maybe a week from now, maybe a month from now. I don't know. Hopefully by the time that Michael and Rob next week give their presentation on the Ruach HaKadosh, that I will be out of jail and on parole on good behavior. So let's go ahead and get started tonight. For the prayer tonight, I actually want to read from a very ancient um, worship pamphlet or prayer. It is from the Odes of Solomon. This is the Ode number three, and, and this will be treated as the prayer tonight. So here we go. I hear somebody typing right now, uh, typing furiously away. That was me. Sorry, dude. I'm stopping. <laughs> All right, here we go. I am putting on the love of Yahuwah, and his members are with him, and I am dependent on them, and he loves me. For I should not have known how to love Yahuwah if he had not continuously loved me. Who is able to distinguish love except him who is loved? I love the beloved, and I myself love him. And he and where his rest is, there also am I. And I shall be no stranger, because there is no jealousy with Yahuwah Most High and Merciful. I have been united to him, because the lover has found the beloved. Because I love him, that is the son, I shall become a son. Indeed, he who is joined to him, who is the mortal, truly shall be immortal. And he who delights in the life will become living. This is the Ruach of Yahuwah, which is not false, which teaches the sons of men to know his ways. Be wise and understanding and awakened. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, the Odes of Solomon, I'm in love with it. I'm going to be quoting from it a lot more tonight, uh, well, in the coming weeks, including tonight. And those are just some really cool prayers. So tonight we will be reading from the Gospel of Nicodemus. And I've dropped a link in here. You can all uh, pull it up. It's rather long. I'm not sure we're going to get through it all tonight. And if not, that's okay. I'll just cut it off at a certain time and then we'll pick it up. Uh, after the presentation um, in a couple weeks from now. So let's get started. Hopefully everyone can pull it up. I actually have a lot of other books that I'm going to be referring to, like the Book of Adam and others. I was going to be reading from some Pontius Pilate material, but as I was studying for this today, I was like, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a little bit repetitive and it's not going to prove in anyone's mind that the letters of Pontius Pilate are legitimate, even though they match up uh, very close to the Gospel of Nicodemus. I mean, it's 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 pretty uh, they're pretty close. But anyways, with that, let's get started. We are going to read chapter one. I'll give you a minute to pull it up. All right, let's get started. The Gospel of Nicodemus, chapter one. Annas and Caiaphas, and Sumas and Datum, Gamaliel, Judas, Levi, Naphtali, Alexander, Cyrus, and other Yehudim, went to Pilate about Yahusha, accusing him with many bad crimes, and said, We are assured that Yahusha is the son of Yosef the carpenter, land born of Miriam, and that he declared and that he declares himself the son of Elohim and a king, and not only so, but attempts to uh, dissolution, uh, dissolution of the Sabbath and the laws of our fathers. Of course, we know that he never attempted to dissolve the Sabbath. 
Pilate replied, what is it which he declares? And what is it which he attempts dissolving? The Yehudim told him, we have a law which forbids doing cures on the Sabbath day, but he cures both the lame and the deaf, those afflicted with palsy, the blind and lepers, and uh, the demon possessed, on that day by wicked methods. Pilate replied, how can you do this by wicked methods? They answered, he is a conjurer and cast out devils by the prince of the devils. And so all these things become subject to him. Then said Pilate, casting out devils seems not to be the work of an unclean spirit, but to proceed from the power of Elohim. The Yehudim replied to Pilate, we entreat your highness to summon him to appear before your tribunal and hear him yourself. Then Pilate called the messenger and said to him, By what means will Mashiach be brought hither? Then went the messenger forth, and knowing Mashiach, worshipped him. And having spread the cloak which he had in his hand upon the ground, he said, Adonai, walk upon this and go in, for the governor calls thee. When the Yehudim perceived what the messenger had done, they exclaimed against him to Pilate and said, Why did you not give him his summons by a beetle and not by a messenger? For the messenger, when he saw him, worshipped him, and spread the cloak which he had in his hand upon the ground before him, and said to him, Adonai, the governor calls thee. Then Pilate called the messenger and said, Why hast thou done thus? The messenger replied, When, when thou sentest me from Jerusalem to Alexander, I saw Yahusha sitting in uh, a mean figure upon a she-ass, and the children of the Hebrews cried out, Hosanna, holding uh, boughs of trees in their hands. Others spread their garments in the way and said, Save us, thou who art in heaven. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of Yahuwah. Then the Yah Yahudim cried out against the messenger and said, The children of the Hebrews made their acclamations in the Hebrew language. And how could thou, who art a Greek, understand the Hebrew? The messenger answered them and said, I asked one of the Yahudim and said, What is this which the children do cry out in the Hebrew language? And he explained to me, saying, They cry out Hosanna, which being interpreted is, O Adonai, save me, or O Adonai, save, or maybe it's O Yahuwah, save. Pilate then said to them, Why do you yourselves testify to the words spoken by the children, namely, by your silence? In what has the messenger done amiss? And they, went, and they were silent. Then the governor said unto the messenger, Go forth and endeavor by any means to bring him in. But the messenger went forth, and did as before, and said, Adonai, come in, for the governor calleth thee. And as Yahushua was going in by the ensigns, who carried the standards, the tops of them bowed down and worshipped Yahushua. This whole scene is, I kind of feel like is, is almost, I, I'm not making light of it, it's almost comical that um, the, the Yahudim are trying so hard to crucify him, and According to the Gospel of Nicodemus, he's constantly being worshipped. Just whatever he does, like like nature itself is uh, just worshiping him. I mean, here we see that the the uh, the standards are like like the, these guys are holding these standards, and we'll see more of it. But it's, they're like bending over, and they they can't help it. Whereupon the Yahudim exclaimed more vehemently against the ensigns. But Pilate said to the Yahudim, I know it is not pleasing to you that the tops of the standards did of themselves bow and worship Yahusha, but why do you excl exclaim against the ensigns as if they had bowed and worshipped? They replied to Pilate, We saw the ensigns themselves bowing and worshipping Yahusha. Then the governor called the ens uh, ensigns and said to them, Why did you do this? They said to Pilate, we are all pagans and worship the Elohim in temples, and how should we think anything about worshiping him? We only held the standards in our hands, and they bowed themselves and worshipped him. Then said Pilate to the rulers of the synagogue, Do ye yourselves choose some oh, do ye yourselves choose some strong men, and let them hold the standards, and we shall see whether they will they will bend of themselves. So I know that none of the other four gospels uh document this incident. Um, but I, I see no problem with, you know, Yahusha says, like through the gospels, like even the, the rocks will cry out. Like I see this as a as a literal, like, 
you know, he has to be worshipped moment. Um, anyways, let's, let's keep reading. So the elders of the Yahudim sought out 12 of the most strong and able old men and made them hold the standards, and they stood in the presence of the governor. Then Pilate said to the messenger, take Yahushua out, and by some means bring him in again. <laughs> and Yahushua and the messengers went out of the hall, and Pilate called the ensigns who had uh, who before had borne the standards and swore to them that if they had not borne the standards in, the, in that manner, when Yahushua before entered in, he would cut off their heads. Then the governor commanded Yahushua to come in again. And the messenger did as he had done before and very much entreated Yahushua that he would go upon his cloak and walk on it. And he did walk upon it and went in. And when Yahushua went in, the standards bowed themselves as before and worshiped him. I'm going to keep reading, guys. If you guys, if anyone wants to jump in at any time, Please do so. You will not be interrupting me. Um, I want to get through the first 10 chapters tonight because the meat of what I want to talk about tonight is kind of like in, in chapters 10 to 20. Now, when Pilate saw this, he was afraid and was about to rise from his seat. But while he thought to rise, his own wife, who stood at a distance, said to him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered much concerning him in a vision this night. We saw this, of course, in the other Gospels. When the Yehudim heard this, they said to Pilate, Did we not say unto thee, He is a conjurer? Behold, he hath caused thy wife to dream. Pilate then calling Yahushua said, Thou hast heard what they testify against thee, and you makest no answer? Yahushua replied, If they had not a power of speaking, they could not have spoke. But because everyone has the command of his own tongue to speak both good and bad, let him look to it. But the elders of, of the Yahudim answered and said to Yahushua, What shall we look to? In the first place, we know this concerning thee, that thou was born through fornication. So um, we have read through the infancy gospels, and we saw where the case was actually settled that Yosef uh, jo uh, and Miriam were forced uh, to, you know, basically drink the cup of jealousy and go through that whole ceremony. And they were proven to be innocent. And, um, and, you know, still to this day, it's kind of interesting that they're, they're really pushing this, this idea that he was not born of a virgin. Uh, secondly, that upon the account of thy birth, the infants were slain in Bethlehem. Well, that's interesting. Thirdly, that thy father and mother, Miriam fled into Egypt because they could not trust their own people. This was um, a theme we saw all through the infancy gospel of Thomas, where the elders of the communities were getting so upset at Mary and Yosef because they were not handing him over to be learned, uh, taught by the elders. And nobody was able to treat Yahusha. And, and so we saw from the very beginning that uh, from the time of his birth, we've, I've seen in multiple accounts that uh, the, the, long before Yahusha actually walked onto the scene as an adult, they were already bitter at this family. Like this bit, this family was, they were seen as rebels because they raised a child that did not go by the traditions of the elders, of the Pharisees. Some of the Yahudim who stood by spake more favorably. We cannot say that he was born through fornication, but we know that his mother Miriam was betrothed to Yosef, and so he was not born through fornication. Then said Pilate to the Yahudim, who affirmed him to be born through fornication, This is your account. Uh, this your account is not true, seeing there was a betrothment, as they testify, who, were, who are of your own nation. Annas and Caiaphas spoke to Pilate. All this multitude of people is to be regarded, who cry out that he was born through fornication and is a conjurer. But they who deny him to be born through fornication are his proselytes and disciples. Pilate answered Annas and Caiaphas, Who are the proselytes? They answered, They are those who are the children of pagans, and are not become Yahudim, but followers of him. Then replied Eliezer and Asterius and Antonius and James, uh, that would be Jacob, and Charis and Samuel, Isaac, Phines, uh, Crispus and Agrippa, Annas and and Yehuda, we are not proselytes, but children of Yahudim, and speak the truth, and were present when Miriam was betrothed. Then Pilate, addressing himself to the twelve men who spake this, said to them, I conjure you by the life of Kaiser, that ye faithfully declare whether he was born through fornication, and those things be true which ye have related. They answered Pilate, We have a law whereby we are forbid to swear, it being a sin. 
let him let them swear by the life of Kaiser that it is not as we have said, and we will be contented to be put to death. Then said Annas and Caiaphas to Pilate, those, twi those twelve men will not believe that we know him to be basely born and to be a conjurer, although he pretends that he is the son of Elohim and a king, which we are so far from believing that we tremble to hear. Then Pilate commanded everyone to go out except the twelve men who said he was not born through fornication. And Yahusha to withdraw to a distance and said to them, why have the Yahudim a mind to kill Yahusha? They answered him, They are angry because he wrought cures on the Sabbath day. Pilate said, Will they kill him for good work? They say unto him, Yes, sir. Chapter 3 Then Pilate, filled with anger, went out of the hall and said to the Yahudim, I call the whole world to witness that I find no faults in this man. The Yahudim replied to Pilate, If he had not been a wicked person, we would not have brought him before thee. Pilate said to them, Do ye take him and try him by your own law? Then the Yahudim said, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Pilate said to the Yahudim, The command, therefore, thou shalt not kill, belongs to you, but not to me. And he went again into the hall and called Yahusha by himself and said to him, Art thou the king of the Yahudim? And Yahusha answering said to Pilate, Dost thou speak this of thyself, or did the Yahudim tell it thee concerning me? Pilate answering said to Yahushua, Am I a Jew? The whole nation and rulers of the Yahudim have delivered thee up to me. What hast thou done? Yahushua answering said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and I should not have been delivered to the Yahudim, but now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate said, Are thou a king then? Yahushua answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born. And for this end came men to the world. And for, the, and for this purpose I came, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Yahushua said, Truth is from heaven. Pilate said, Therefore truth is not on earth. Yahushua said to Pilate, believe that, believe that truth is on earth among those who, when they have the power of judgment, are governed by truth and form right judgment. So, so far, we haven't really seen a lot of variation from the Gospels, except for the the story of the messenger that threw down his cloak and then the banners that um, kind of bowed down to him. But the dialogue so far seems pretty on par with what we see in, in John and, and, uh, and the other Gospels. So keep reading. Then Pilate left Yahushua in the hall and went out to the Yahudim and, and said, I find not any one fault in Yahushua. The Yahudim say unto him, but he said, I can destroy the temple of Elohim and in three days build it up again. You know what's funny about this, and you've probably all picked up on this, is they're, they're purposely, we know that they're misrepresenting this quote because they, because we know that they go to Pilate afterwards to get the guards there to guard his body for three days because they know what he's actually talking about. Pilate saith unto them, what sort of temple is that of which he speaketh? The Yahudim saying to him, that which Solomon was 46 years in building, he said he would destroy, and in three days build up. Pilate said to them again, I am innocent from the blood of that man. Do ye look to it? The Yahudim say to him, his blood be upon us and our children. I'm trying to remember which other gospel says that, but that's, that's a big ouch there. And then Pilate, calling together the elders and scribes, priests and Levites, saith to them privately, do not act thus. I have found nothing in your charge against him concerning his curing sick persons and breaking the Sabbath worthy of death. The priests and Levites replied to Pilate, By the life of Caesar, if anyone be a blasphemer, he is worthy of death. But this man hath blasphemed against Yahuwah. Then the governor again commanded the Yahudim to depart out of the hall, and calling Yahusha, said to him, What shall I do with thee? Yahusha answered him, Do according as it is written. Pilate said to him, <laughs> How is it written? Yahushua saith to him, Moses and the prophets have prophesied concerning my suffering and resurrection. The Yahudim, hearing this, were provoked and said to Pilate, Why wilt thou any longer hear the blasphemy of that man? Pilate saith to them, If these words seem to you blasphemy, do ye, do ye take him, bring him to your court, and try him according to your law. The Yahudim replied to Pilate, 
Our law saith he shall be obliged to receive nine and thirty stripes. But if after this manner he shall blaspheme against Yahuwah, he shall be stoned. Pilate saith unto them, If that speech of his was blasphemy, do ye try him according to your law. The Yahudim say to Pilate, Our law commands us not to put anyone to death. We desire that he may be crucified because he deserves the death of the cross. Pilate said to them, It is not fit he should be crucified. Let him be only whipped and sent away. But when the governor looked upon the people that were present in the Yahudim, he saw many of the Yahudim in tears and said to the chief priests of the Yahudim, All the people do not desire his death. The elders of the Yahudim answered to Pilate, We and all the people came hither for this very purpose, that he should die. Pilate saith to them, Why should he die? They said to him, because he declares himself to be the son of Elohim and a king. Chapter 5 But Nicodemus, a certain Jew, stood before the governor and said, I entreat thee, O righteous judge, that thou wouldst favor me with the liberty of speaking a few words. Pilate said to him, Speak on. Nicodemus said, I spake to the elders of the Yahudim and the scribes and priests and Levites and all the multitude of the Yahudim in their assembly. What is it ye would do with this man? He is a man who hath wrought many useful and glorious miracles, such as no man on earth ever wrought before, nor will ever work. Let him go and do him no harm. If he cometh from Elohim, his miracles, his miraculous cures, will continue. But if from men, they will come to naught. Thus Moses, when he was sent by Elohim into Egypt, wrought the miracles which Elohim commanded him before Pharaoh king of Egypt. And though the magicians of that country, Janus and Jambres, wrought by their magic the same miracles which Moses did, yet they could not work all which he did. And the miracles which the magicians wrought were not of Elohim, as ye know, O scribes and Pharisees, but they were wrought, uh, but they who wrought them perished, and all who believed them. And now let this man go, because the very miracles for which ye accuse him are from Elohim, and he is not worthy of death. The Yahudim then said to Nicodemus, Art thou become his disciple, and making speeches in his favor? Nicodemus said to them, Is the governor become his disciple also, and does he make speeches for him? Did not Caesar place him in that high post? When the Yahudim heard this, they trembled and gnashed their teeth at Nicodemus, and said to him, Mayest thou receive his doctrine for truth, and have thy lot with Mashiach. That's almost like a slip of the tongue right there, like a Freudian slip. They just said, And have thy lot with Mashiach. Nicodemus replied, <laughs> Amen. I will receive his doctrine and my lot with him, as ye have said. Then another certain Jew rose up and desired leave of the governor to hear him a few words. And the governor said, Speak what thou hast a mind. And he said, I lay for 38 years by the sheep pool of uh, Jerusalem, laboring under a great infirmity and waiting for a cure which should be wrought by the coming of an angel. Who at, who at a certain time troubled the water, and whosoever first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And when Yahushua saw me languishing there, or languishing there, he said to me, Wilt thou be made whole? And I answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. And he said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And I was immediately made whole and took up my bed and walked. The Yahudim then said to Pilate, our Lord Governor, pray ask him what day it was on which he was cured for his infirmity. The infirm person replied, It was on the Sabbath. The Yahudim said to Pilate, Did we not say that he wrought his cures on the Sabbath and cast out devils by the prince of devils? Then another certain Jew came forth and said, I was blind, could hear sounds, but could not see anyone. And as Yahushua was going along, I heard the multitude passing by, and I asked, What was there? They told me that Yahushua was passing by. Then I cried out, saying, Yahushua, son of David, have mercy on me. And he stood still and commanded that I should be brought to him and said to him, What wilt thou? I said, Adonai, that I may receive my sight. He said to me, Receive thy sight. And presently I saw and followed him, rejoicing and giving thanks. Another Jew also came forth and said, I was a leper, and he cured me by his word only, saying, I will be thou clean. And presently I was cleansed from my leprosy. And another Jew came forth and said, I was crooked, and he made me straight by his word. And a certain woman named uh, Veronica said, I was afflicted with an issue of blood twelve years, 
and I touched the hem of his garments, and presently the issue of my blood stopped. The Yahudim then said, We have a law that a woman shall not be allowed as an evidence. And after other things, another Jew said, I saw Yahushua invited to a wedding with his disciples, and there was a want of wine in Cana of Galilee. And when the wine was all drank, he commanded the servants that they should fill six pots with which were there with water, and they filled them up to the brim, and he blessed them and turned the water into wine, and all the people drank, being surprised at this miracle. And yet another Jew stood forth and said, I saw Yahushua teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum, and there was in the synagogue a certain man who had a devil, and he cried out, saying, Let me alone. What have we to do with thee, uh, Yahushua of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know that thou art the Holy One of Elohim. And Yahushua rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, unclean spirit, and come out of the man. And presently he came out of him and did not at all hurt him. The following things were also said by a Pharisee. I saw that a great company came to Yahushua from Galilee and Judea, and the seacoast, and many countries about Jordan, and many infirm persons came to him, and he healed them all. And I heard the unclean spirits crying out and saying, Thou art the son of Elohim. And Yahushua strictly charged them that they should not make him known. After this, another person whose name was Centurio said, I saw Yahushua in Capernaum, and I entreated him, saying, Adonai, my servant uh, lieth at home sick of the palsy. And Yahushua said to me, I will come and cure him. But I said, Adonai, I am not worthy that thou shalt come under my roof, but only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And Yahushua said unto him, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And my servant was healed from the same hour. <laughs> then a certain nobleman said, I had a son in Capernaum who lay at the point of death. And when I heard that Yahushua was coming to Galilee, I went and besought him that he would come down to my house and heal my son, for he was at the point of death. He said to me, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And my son was cured from that hour. Besides these, also many others of the Yahudim, both men and women, cried out and said, He is truly the son of Elohim, who cures all diseases only by his word, and to whom the devils are altogether subject. Some of them further said, This power can proceed from none but Elohim. Pilate said to the Yahudim, Why are not the devils subject to your doctrines? Ouch. <laughs> Some of them said, The power of subject subjecting devils cannot proceed but from Elohim. But others said to Pilate that he had risen Lazarus from the dead after he had been four days in the grave. The, governing, the governor hearing this, trembling, said to the multitude of the Yahudim, What will it profit you to shed innocent blood? All right, so this whole scene I find fascinating because in the other Gospels, we don't get really the sense it's almost like he shows up to be tried and everyone's like, crucify him, crucify him. And, you know, and, and, you know, Pilate's a little hesitant, but then they, they crucify him. But here we get, we get a scene where witness after witness after witness, remember now they, they've already tried him. Uh, the, the, the uh, Sadducees have already tried him privately at night under the cloak of darkness in the temple court. Well, now we have a trial in broad daylight, and it, it's almost like the, the the closing scene of a play where, you know, you would ask the question, well, how is it that all these witnesses who were in the Bible all here? Well, it's Passover, right? So everyone has come to Jerusalem, the streets are packed, and all these people who were, who were affected by his ministry are all here saying, no, like this guy is legit, and he's healing by the power of Elohim. And you have witness after witness after witness after witness coming forward. Um, so, I don't know, that's kind of cool. I was going to read from the letters of Pontius Pilate. And again, I felt like, well, no point. But you get the same sense uh, from this. Like, if I were to read this and then read those side by side, you'd go, oh, wow. Like, he's Pilate is actually talking about the same witnesses that came forward that, again, are not necessarily documented in the other Gospels. All right, chapter 6. <clears throat> Then Pilate, having called together Nicodemus and the fifteen men who said that Yahushua was not born through fornication, said to them, What shall I do, seeing there is like to be a tumult among the people? They said unto him, We know not. Let them look to it who raised the tumult. Pilate then called the multitude again and said to them, Ye know that ye have a custom that I should release to you one prisoner at the feast of the Passover. I have a noted prisoner, a murderer, who is called Barabbas and Yahushua, who is called Mashiach. 
in whom I find nothing that deserves death. Which of them, therefore, have you a mind that I should release to you? And they all cried out and say, Release to us Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Yahusha, who is called Mashiach? They all answered, Let him be crucified. Again they cried out and said to Pilate, You are not the friend of Caesar if you release this man, for he hath declared that he is the son of Elohim and a king, but you are inclined that he should be king and not Caesar? Then Pilate, filled with anger, said to them, Your nation hath always been seditious, and you are always against those who have been serviceable to you? The Yahudim replied, Who are those who have been serviceable to us? <laughs> Pilate answered them, Your Elohim who delivered you from the hard bondage of the Egyptians and brought you over the Red Sea as though it had been dry land and fed you in the wilderness with manna and the flesh of quails and brought water out of the rocks and, you, and gave you a law from heaven. You provoked him always and desired for yourself a molten calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are thy Elohim, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Technically, nothing he said there was incorrect. That's all true. On account of which your Elohim was inclined to destroy you. But Moses interceded for you and your Elohim heard him and forgave your iniquity. Afterwards, you were in enraged against and would have killed your prophets, Moses and Aaron, when they fled to the tabernacle, and ye were always murmuring against Elohim and his prophets. And arising from his judgment seat, he would have gone out, but the Yahudim all cried out, We acknowledge Caesar to be king and not Yahusha. Um, okay, let me just stop here and pause because we have been reading how the um these Pharisees, these scribes, uh Levites, they're coming before um Pontius Pilate, and they're like, we have a law, we have a law, we have a law. They're actually quoting from, as you guys know, two laws, one from Torah and one from their oral tradition. They're kind of mixing them together. And and they're like, and here we see Pontius Pilate, he's kind of playing the buffoon the whole time, like asking these questions, like he doesn't know anything. But right here, he twisted on them, being the good governor he is. I mean, if you're going to be a governor of, I mean, historians have pointed out, if you're going to be the governor over Jerusalem, you get to know the culture, you get to know the law, you memorize their Torah. And here he just, he turns it and be like, boom, I, I know your Torah better than you guys do. And like, yeah. So I just, I loved how he just, he turned the table on them right there and just started going through the whole process of, of all the whining and complaining and how they were just in constant rebellion against Elohim. And he's saying, he's saying like all that rebellion you guys had in the wilderness, when your own Elohim delivered you, you're doing the same thing right now, just so you know. Anyways, where is this person? As soon as he was born, the wise men came and offered gifts unto him, which when Herod heard, he was exceedingly troubled and would have killed him. When his father knew this, he fled with his mother and mother Miriam into Egypt. Herod, when he heard he was born, would have slain him, and accordingly sent, sent and slew all the children which were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof, from two years old and under. Now this is kind of interesting here because, according to the uh, all the, the 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 letters of Pontius Pilate, if they are legit, I don't know, but he he puts all the blame on Herod. He puts a huge amount of like he clearly did not like the Herods. Even I mean, even Pontius Pilate was like, okay, this is clearly a puppet king, and you know, just whatever. I don't think Rome liked the Herods too much, especially considering that the Herods actually teamed up with um, with Mark Antony and Cleopatra to take out uh, uh, Caesar Augustus or Octavius. He had a, Herod had to do a lot of butt kissing to stay in power. When Pilate heard this account, he was afraid, and commanding silence among the people who made a noise, he said to Yahushua, Art thou therefore a king? All the Yahudim replied to Pilate, He is the very person whom Herod sought to have slain. Then Pilate, taking water, washed his hands before the people and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You look into it. The Yahudim answered and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Oh dear. Then Pilate commanded Yahushua to be brought before him, and spake to him in the following words, Thy own nation hath charged thee as making thyself a king. Wherefore I, Pilate, sentence thee to be whipped according to the laws of former governors, and that thou be first bound, then hanged upon a cross in the place where thou art now a prisoner, and also two criminals with thee, whose names are Demas and Gistus. 
of chapter 7. Then Yahushua went out of the hall, and the two thieves with him. And when they came to the place, which is called Golgotha, they stripped him of his raiment and girt him about uh, with a linen cloth and put a crown of thorns upon his head and put a reed in his hand. And in like manner did they uh, to the two thieves who were crucified with him, Demas on his right hand and Gestas on his left. But Yahushua said, My father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments, and upon his vestures they cast lots. The people in the meantime stood by, and the chief priests and the elders of the Yahudi mocked him, saying, He saved others, let him now save himself if he can. If he be the son of Elohim, let him now come down from the cross. The soldiers also mocked him, and taking uh, vinegar and gall, offered it to him to drink, and said to him, If thou art king of the Yahudi, deliver thyself. Then uh, Longinus, a certain soldier, taking a spear, pierced his side, and presently there came forth blood and water. So here we see the name of the soldier, uh, Longinus, and a whole other discussion. I, apparently, like he's, uh, he's like one of those uh, immortal soldiers that the uh, was it the Highlander series was based upon. That's a whole other side topic. But <clears throat> also, fun fact: that actual spear. Uh, it was found out later. Um, uh, L.A. Mazzulli did a whole uh, thing on it that that spear was actually in a window in Long Beach, California, just a, like a like an antique store, like in plain sight. Uh, the occult put it there, and that's crazy because I was born and raised in Long Beach, California. I, I often wonder, man, how many times did I pass that antique store and see that spear just sitting there and think nothing of it. And Pilate wrote the, the title upon the cross in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek letters. This is the king of the Yahudim. But one of the two thieves who were crucified with Yahushua, whose name was Gesta, said to Yahushua, If thou art Mashiach, deliver thyself and us. But the thief who was crucified on his right hand, whose name was Demas, answering, rebuked him and said, Dost not thou fear Elohim, who art condemned to this punishment? We indeed receive rightly and justly the uh, demerit of our actions. But this Yahushua, what evil hath he done? After this groaning, he said to Yahushua, Adonai, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Yahushua answering said to him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And of course, this narrative, uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, will answer that question of the war of the comma. Uh, what does he mean that on this day thou shalt be with me in paradise? Chapter 8. And it was about the sixth hour, and darkness was upon the face of the whole earth until the ninth hour. And while the sun was eclipsed, behold, the veil of the temple. Okay, uh, fun fact. Uh, for those of you who were in our discussion today in the, I think it was the seventh day Sabbath room, but it may have been the, um, the calendar room. Uh, I don't know if she's here tonight, but Lisa um, in our group is presenting the case. And she has written a couple articles on in cosmology that the, the month actually begins with a full moon and not a crescent moon. And it's, it's a very interesting argument that she makes. And one of her points is that, what do we see here? We see, what, what, when does the sun get eclipsed? It's not with a full moon. It's never with a full moon because the full moon and the sun have to be on opposite sides of the earth, right? The sun sets and the full moon comes up. They're the two witnesses that are on either side. You can see them at the same time. Um, a, a crescent moon is it can't be over the sun because it is a crescent moon. The only time we ever have these eclipses, like what we saw in 2017, I think we're going to see it again in, what is it, 2024, um, is when the moon is completely dark and it passes right over the sun. And so if we are seeing that here, think about this, guys. Like if we're seeing this here, if, if, if this is not a supernatural darkening of the sun, but it is actually the moon passing if it is a lunar solar eclipse or i should say a solar eclipse that is testimony to the fact that the month starts with a full moon and not a crescent because here we are 14 15 days into it and the full moon has diminished to nothing all right so just food for thought i i, I had never thought of that until today so that really came at the perfect timing um something i'll be thinking about a lot and while the sun was eclipsed behold the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, and the rock also were rent, and graves, and the graves opened, and many bodies of saints which slept arose. So the rest of the book, we're going to be looking at who these people were 
that came out of the graves because this is mentioned in Matthew very briefly. And it's kind of like, it like drops a microphone and just, you know, Matthew walks out of the room. He never explains it further, what was going on. And about the ninth hour, Yahushua cried out with a loud voice saying, uh, Heli, Heli, Lama Sabatani, which being interpreted as my Elohim, my Elohim, what has thou forsaken me? Why has thou forsaken me? And after these things, Yahushua said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the Ruach. But when the centurion saw that Yahushua thus crying out gave up the Ruach, he glorified Elohim and said, Of a truth, this was a just man. And all the people who stood by were exceedingly troubled at the sight, and reflecting upon what had passed, smote upon their breast, and then returned to the city of Jerusalem. The centurion went to the governor and related to him all that had passed. And when he had heard all these things, he was exceedingly sorrowful. And calling the Yahudim together, said to them, Have ye seen the miracle of the sun's eclipse, and the other things which came to pass while Yahushua was dying? And here it says the sun was eclipsed. So that's kind of interesting. It's not that the sun just went dark. It says the sun was actually eclipsed. Um, and a, and a, an eclipse of that magnitude, like what we saw in the United States several years ago, was that it could, I, I, I could assume that it could eclipse from Israel to Rome. It could be that large of a distance. It could have covered most of the uh, known world. Um, and the other things which came to pass while Yahushua was dying, which when the Yahudim heard, they answered the governor, the eclipse of the sun happened according to its usual custom. Hmm, interesting. But all those who were the acquaintance of Mashiach stood at a distance, as did the women who had followed Yahushua from Galilee, observing all these things. And behold, a certain man of Arimathea named Yosef, who also was the disciple of Yahushua, but not openly so for fear of the Yahudim, came to the governor and entreated the governor that he would give him leave to take away the body of Yahushua from the cross. And the governor gave him leave. And Nicodemus came, bringing with him a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they took down Yahushua from the cross with tears and bound him with linen cloths with spices, according to the custom of bearing among the Yahudim, and, place, and placed him in a new tomb, which Yosef had built, and caused to be cut out of the rock, in which never any man had been put. And they rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher. Chapter 9. When the unjust Yahudim heard that Yosef had begged and buried the body of Yahushua, they sought after Nicodemus and those 15 men who had testified before the governor that Yahushua was not born through fornication and other good persons who had shown any good actions towards him. But when they had, excuse me, but when they all concealed themselves through the fear of the Yahudim, Nicodemus alone showed himself to them and said, how can such persons as these enter into the synagogue? Those would be fighting words. Then, they, obviously, they can't drop that challenge. The Yahudim answered him, But how does, how does thou enter into the synagogue, who was a confederate with Mashiach? It's almost like a, I know you are, but what am I? You know, Kindergarten 101. I get that discourse online a lot. Let, uh, let thy lot be along with him in the other world. Hmm. See a little bit of the Talmud there, huh? I mean, here they, they actually they call him. Mashiach there, like another Freudian slip. And then let thy lot be along with him in the other world. And what does the Talmud say, right? That that uh Jesus is burning in like in like or tar or whatever. <clears throat> Nicodemus answered, Amen. So may it be that I may have my lot with him in his kingdom. In like manner, Yosef, when he came to the Yahudim, said to them, why are ye angry with me for desiring the body of Yahushua of Pilate? Behold, I have put him in my tomb and wrapped him up in clean linen and put a stone at the door of the sepulcher. I have acted rightly towards him, but ye have acted unjustly, aghast that just person, and crucifying him, giving him vinegar to drink, crowning him with thorns, tearing his body with whips, and prayed down the guilt of his blood upon you. The Yahudim, at hearing of this, were disquieted and troubled, and they seized Yosef and commanded him to be put in custody before the Sabbath and kept there till the Sabbath was over. And they said to him, Make confession, for at this time it is not lawful to do thee any harm till the first day of the week come. But we know that thou will not be thought worthy of a burial, but we will give thy flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the earth. 
Yosef answered, That speech is like the speech of proud Goliath, who reproached the living Elohim in speaking against David. But ye scribes and doctors know that Elohim saith by the prophet, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay to you evil equal to that which ye have threatened to me. The Elohim whom you have hanged upon the cross is able to deliver me out of your hands. All your wickedness will return upon you. For the governor, when he washed his hands, said, I am clear from the blood of this just person. But ye answered and cried out, His blood be upon us and our children. According as ye have said, may ye perish forever. Now, I just need to point out here that, that Nicodemus's, uh, I'm sorry, Yosef's, um, his entire, I guess this is Yosef speaking here, his, his entire speech is, is phenomenal because here the Mashiach has just been killed. Like he's dead. And he's saying, yeah, my lot, like, He's still coming. I, I know it looks bad, guys, like he's dead, but I still believe I'm coming in his kingdom. And um, and ev even though he just died on that cross, like he can still deliver me out of your hands. Like that's that's pretty powerful uh, faith and faithfulness right there. <clears throat> um, okay, let's go to verse 12. I'm not sure if I read all 11. The elders of the Yahudim hearing these words were exceedingly enraged and seizing Yosef, they put him into a chamber where there was no window. They fastened the door and put a seal upon the lock. So now they're both in prison, Nicodemus and Yosef. And Annas and Caiaphas placed a guard upon it and took counsel with the priests and Levites that they should all meet after the Sabbath, and they contrived to what death they should put Yosef. When they had done this, the rulers Annas and Caiaphas ordered Yosef to be brought forth. When all, uh, chapter 10. When all the assembly heard this, they admired and were astonished because they found the same zeal upon oh, the same seal upon the lock of the chamber and could not find Yosef. Then Annas and Caiaphas went forth, and while they were all admiring at Yosef's being gone, behold, one of the soldiers who kept the sepulchre of Yahusha spake in the assembly that while they were guarding the sepulchre, sepulchre of Yahusha, there was an earthquake, and we saw an angel of Elohim roll away the stone of the sepulchre and set upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his garment like snow, and we became through fear like persons dead. And we heard an angel saying to the woman of the sepulchre of Yahusha, Do not fear. I know that you seek Yahusha who was crucified. He is risen, as he foretold. Come and see the place where he was laid. And go presently and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And he will go before you into Galilee, that ye shall see him as, as he told you. Then the Yahudim called together all the soldiers who kept the sepulcher of Yahusha and said to them. So I, so I love this whole thing here, how we're getting a, a, like a flip of the narrative. So now we're going to see the, the, the soldiers' actual testimony. Who are those women to whom the angel spoke? Why did ye not seize them? The soldiers answered and said, We know not whom the women were. Besides, we became as dead persons through fear. And how could we seize those women? The Yahudim said to them, As Yahuwah liveth, we do not believe you. The soldiers answering said to the Yahudim, When ye saw and heard Yahushua working so many miracles and did not believe him, how should ye believe us? Uh, ye will said, As Yahuwah liveth, for Yahuwah truly does live. According to the uh, the the letters of Pontius Pilate. These guards who kept the tomb actually appear to be have become believers. Uh, with Pontius Pilate, they believed in Mashiach after this. We have heard that you shut up Yosef, who buried the body of Yahusha in a chamber under a lock which was sealed, and when he opened it, found him not there. Do ye then produce Yosef, whom ye put under guard in the chamber, and we will produce Yahusha, whom we guarded in the sepulchre. Nice challenge there. The Yahudim answered and said, We will produce Yosef. Do ye produce Yahusha? <laughs> but Yosef is in his own city of Arimathea. The soldiers replied, If if Yosef be in Arimathea and Yahusha in Galilee, we heard the angel inform the woman. The Yahudim hearing this were afraid and said among themselves, If by any means these things should become public, then everybody will believe in Yahusha. Then they gathered a large sum of money and gave it to the soldiers, saying, Do ye tell the people that the disciples of Yahusha came in the night when you were asleep and stole away the body of Yahusha? And if Pilate the governor should hear of this, we will satisfy him and secure you. The soldiers accordingly took the money and said, as they were instructed by the Yahudim, and the report was spread ab abroad among the people. 
But a certain priest, uh, uh, Phineas, Ada, um, Ada, a schoolmaster, and a Levite named uh, Agius. Go ahead. Oh, uh, oath of Yah, Lisa, your microphone is on. I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we have seen Yahusha, whom you crucified, talking with his eleven disciples and sitting in the midst of them in Mount the Mount of Olives and saying to them, go forth into the whole world, preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, and whosoever shall believe and be baptized shall be saved. And when he had said these things to his disciples, we saw him ascending up to heaven. When the chief priests and elders and Levites heard these things, they said to these three men, give glory to the Elohim of Israel and make confession to him whether those things are true, which ye say ye have seen and heard. They answering said, As Yahuwah of our fathers liveth, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob, according as we heard Yahusha talking with his disciples, and according as we saw him ascending up to heaven, so we have related the truth to you. And the three men uh, farther answered and said, Adding these words, if we should not own the words which we heard Yahusha speak, and that we saw him ascending into heaven, we should be guilty of sin. And then the chief priests immediately rose up and holding the book of the law in their hands, conjured these men saying, ye shall no more hereafter declare those things which ye have spoke concerning Yahusha. And they gave them a large sum of money and sent other persons along with them who should conduct them to their own country that they might not by any means make any stay at Jerusalem. <laughs> then the Yahudim did assemble all together and having expressed the most lamentable concern said, what is this extra, extra, uh, extraordinary thing which has come to pass in Jerusalem? But Annas and Caiaphas comforted them, comforted them saying, why should we believe the soldiers who guarded the sepulcher of Yahushua and telling us that an angel rolled away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Perhaps his own disciples told them this and gave them money that they should say so. And they themselves took away the body of Yahusha. Besides, consider this, that there is no credit to be given to foreigners because they also took a large sum of us and they have declared to us according to the instructions which we gave them. They must either be faithful to us or to the disciples of Yahusha. Chapter 11. Then Nicodemus arose and said, Ye say right, O sons of Israel. Ye have heard what those three men have sworn by the law of Elohim, who said, We have seen Yahushua speaking with his disciples upon, upon Mount, um, the Mount of Olives, and we saw him ascending up to heaven. And the scripture teaches us that, that the blessed prophet Elijah was taken up to heaven. And Elisha, being asked by the sons of the prophets, Where is, your fa where, where is their father Elijah? He said to them that he is taken up to heaven. And the sons of the prophets said to him, Perhaps the Spirit hath carried him into one of the mountains of Israel. There perhaps we shall find him. And they besought Elisha, and he walked about with them three days, and they could not find him. And now hear me, O sons of Israel, and let us send men into the mountains of Israel, lest perhaps the Spirit hath carried away Yahusha, and there perhaps we shall find him and be satisfied. And the counsel of Nicodemus pleased all the people, and they sent forth men who sought for Yahusha, but could not find him. And they returning said, we went all about, but could not find Yahusha, but we have found Yosef in the city of Arimathea. The rulers hearing this and all the people were glad and praised Elohim of Israel because Yosef was found, whom they had shut up in a chamber and could not find. And when they had formed a large assembly, the chief priest said, By what means shall we bring Yosef to speak to us with him? And taking a piece of paper, they wrote to him and said, uh, Shalom be with thee and all thy family. We know that we have offended against Elohim and thee. Be pleased to give a visit to us, your fathers, for we were perfectly surprised at your escape from prison. We know that it was malicious counsel which we took against thee, and that Yahuwah took care of thee, and Yahuwah himself delivered thee from our designs. Peace be unto thee, Yosef, who are honorable among all the people. And they chose seven of Yosef's friends and said to them, When ye come to Yosef, salute him in peace and give him this letter. Accordingly, when the men came to Yosef, they did salute him in peace and gave him the letter. And when Yosef had read it, he said, Blessed be Yahuwah Elohim, who didst deliver me from the Israelites, that they could not shed my blood. Blessed be Elohim, who has protected me under his wings. And Yosef kissed them and took them into his house. And on the morrow, Yosef mounted his ass and went along with them to Jerusalem. And when all the Yahudim heard these things, 
that he went out to meet him and cried out, saying, Shalom, attend thy coming hither, Father Yosef. To which he answered, Prosperity from Yahuwah attend all the people. And they all kissed him, and Nicodemus took him to his house, having prepared a large <laughs> entertainment. But on the morrow, being a preparation day, Annas and Caiaphas and Nicodemus said to Yosef, Make confession to the Elohim of Israel and answer to us all those questions which we shall ask thee. For we have been very much troubled that thou didst bury the body of Yahusha, and that when he had locked thee in a chamber, uh, we could not find thee. And we have been afraid ever since, till this time of thy appearing among us. Tell us therefore before Elohim all that came to pass. Then Yosef answering said, Ye did indeed put me under confinement on the day of preparation till the morning. But while I was standing at prayer in the middle of the night, the house was surrounded with four angels. And I saw Yahusha as the brightness of the sun and fell down upon the earth for fear. But Yahusha, laying hold on my hand, lifted me from the ground, and the dew was then sprinkled upon me. But he, wiping my face, kissed me and said unto me, Fear not, Yosef, look upon me, for it is I. Then I looked upon him and said, uh, Rabboni Elias. He answered me, I am not Elias, but Yahusha of Nazareth, whose body thou did bury. I said to him, Show me the tomb in which I laid thee. Then Yahusha, taking me by the hand, led me into the place where I laid him, and showed me the linen cloths and napkin which I put round his head. Then I knew that it was Yahusha, and worshipped him, and said, Blessed be he who cometh in the name of Yahuwah. Yahusha again, taking me by the hand, led me to Arimathea to my own house, and said to me, Peace be to thee, but go not out of thy house till the fortieth day, but I must go to my disciples. So, um... Here, it, the, the way this narrative goes, it, it's almost like like he just resurrects and then all of a sudden he ascends. Um, but we see here clearly that f- the 40 days have passed from the resurrection to his ascension uh, based on Yahushua's instructions that he is not to leave his house for those 40 days. And of course, he leaves the house to go to Jerusalem at their, uh, their calling. Chapter 12. When the priests, when the chief priests had heard all these things, they were astonished and fell down with their faces on the ground as dead men, and crying out to another, said, What is this ex- extraordinary sign which has come to pass in Jerusalem? We know the father and mother of Yahusha. And a certain Levite said, I know many of his relations, religious persons, who are wont to, uh, sacrifi- to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Elohim of Israel in the temple with prayers. And when the high priest Simeon took him in his arms, he said to him, Yahuwah, now lettest thou thy servant depart in shalom, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to enlighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people. Um, one, one of the things I'm getting in this book is that all these stories that happened in the Gospels, it wasn't like something secretive that the writers of the Gospels kind of figured out by talking to the right people. Like these were stories that everybody knew about. Like everybody knew that Simeon, um, it was said that he would not die until he saw the Mashiach. And so here he is holding baby Yahusha in his arms and saying, this is him. And like, everybody knew that everybody knew growing up that there was this boy Yahusha growing up, becoming a man that that's who Simeon prayed over. Um, It was all known in the temple. Simeon, in like manner, blessed Miriam, the mother of Yahushua, and said to her, I declare to thee concerning that child, he is appointed for the fall and rising again of many, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, and the thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. Then said all the Yahudim, let us send to those three men who said they saw him talking with his disciples in Mount Olivet. After this, they asked uh, them what they had seen, who answered with one accord, In the presence of the Elohim of Israel, we affirm that we plainly saw Yahushua talking with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and ascending up to heaven. Then Annas and Caiaphas took them into separate places and examined them separately. So what, what they're doing now is just like from the book of... Um, uh, the book of Susanna. Remember Daniel, he separated the two elders. And he asked them separately, and he, he showed them to be liars. So they're going to take them apart now, and they're going to prove that these guys are liars. They're making this whole thing up, that, you know, Yahushua never ascended to heaven. Uh, okay, so he examined them separately, who unanimously confessed the truth and said they had seen Yahushua. 
Then Annas and Caiaphas said, Our law saith, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. But what have we said? The blessed Enoch pleased Elohim and was translated by the word of Elohim. And the burying place of the blessed Moses is unknown. But Yahushua was delivered to Pilate, whipped, crowned with thorns, spit upon, <laughs> pierced with a spear, crucified, died upon the cross, and was buried. And his body, the honorable Yosef, buried in a new sepulcher, and he testifies that he saw him alive. And besides, these men have declared that they saw him talking with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and ascending up to heaven. Then Yosef, rising up, said to Annas and Caiaphas, Ye may be justly under a great surprise that you have been told that Yahushua is alive and gone up to heaven. It is indeed a, a thing really surprising that he should not only himself arise from the dead, but also raise others from their graves, who have been seen by many in Jerusalem. This is where the story really starts to get good, guys, where we, we start seeing who all these dead people are, that they're, they're alive and walking around. And now hear me a little. We all knew the blessed Simeon, the high priest, who took Yahusha when an infant into his arms in the temple. This same Simeon had two sons of his own, and were all present at their death and funeral. Go therefore and see their tombs, for these are open, and they are risen. And behold, they are in the city of Arimathea, spending their time together in offices of devotion. Some indeed have heard the sound of their voices in prayer. But they will not discourse with anyone, but they continue as mute, as dead men. But come, let us go to them and behave ourselves towards them with all due respect and caution. And if we can bring them to swear, perhaps they will tell us some of the mysteries of the resurrection. When the Yahudim heard this, they were exceedingly rejoiced. Then Annas and Caiaphas, Nicodemus, Yosef, and Gamaliel uh, Interesting, there's Gamaliel right there. Went to Arimathea, but did not find them in their graves. But walking about the city, they bound them on their bended knees as their they were oh, they bounded them on their bended knees as at their devotions. Then saluting them with all respect and deference to Elohim, they brought them to the synagogue at, at Jerusalem, and having shut the gates, they took the book of the law of Yahuwah, and putting it in their hands, swore them by Elohim Adonai and the Hel Elohim of Israel, who spake uh, to our fathers by the law and the prophets, saying, If ye believe uh, him who raised you from the dead to be Yahusha, tell us what ye have seen and how ye were raised from the dead. Uh, their names are uh, Charinus and Lynthius, the, the two sons of Simeon, trembled when they heard these things, and were disturbed and groaned. And at the same time, looking up to heaven, they made the sign of the cross with their fingers on their tongues. Um, I've commented on here, I, I, I wish I would have taken notes of this, of, of what the, the Hebrew letter that they're probably signing there, which happens to be the same letter that appears um, Yaakob um, signed with his two arms when he blessed Manasseh and Ephraim. <clears throat> and immediately they spake and said, Give, us, give each of us some paper and we will write down for you all those things which we have seen. And they each sat down and wrote saying chapter 13 O Adonai Yahusha and father who art Elohim also the resurrection and life of the dead give us leave to declare thy mysteries which we saw after thy death after death belonging to thy cross for we are sworn by thy name for thou hast for forbid thy servants to declare the secret things which were wrought by thy divine power in Sheol when we were placed with our fathers in the depth of Sheol, in the blackness of darkness, on a sudden, there appeared the color of the sun like gold, in a substantial purple-colored light enlightening the place. Presently upon this, Adam, the father of all mankind, with all the patriarchs and prophets, rejoiced and said, That light is the author of everlasting light, who hath promised to translate us to everlasting light. Um, the scene I see here, and if we have time, I have pages of notes. Um, it's taken me longer to get to this point than I had wanted to. Uh, pages of notes of all the different scriptural references to Yahushua going to Sheol. And I think that what we're seeing here is that they're, they're literally, the scene I see is that they're, they're literally asleep in Sheol. And we're actually seeing them wake up. They're, like, they're waking up in the darkness and starting their, their, their Ruach is starting to speak. 
Uh, then Yashiyahu the prophet cried out and said, This is the light of the Father and the Son of Elohim, according to my prophecy, when I was alive upon earth. The, Z the land of Zebulon and the land of Na uh, Naphtalim, beyond Jordan, a people who walked in darkness, saw a great light. And to them who dwelled in the region of the shadow of death, light has arisen. And now he has come and hath enlightened us who sat in death. And while we were all rejoicing in the light which shone upon us, our father Simeon came among us and congratulating all the company said, Glorify Adonai Yahushua Mashiach, the son of Elohim, whom I took in my arms when an infant in the temple. And being moved by the Ruach HaKadosh said to him and acknowledged that now mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. All the saints who were in the depths, the depth of Sheol, hearing this, rejoiced the more. Afterwards, there came forth one little, one like a little hermit, and was asked by everyone, "Who art thou?" To which he replied, "I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Johann the Baptist, and the prophet of the Most High, who went before his coming to prepare his way, to give the knowledge of salvation to his people for the forgiveness of sins." And I, Johann, when I saw Yahushua coming to me. Being moved by the Ruach HaKodesh, I said, Behold the Lamb of Elohim, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And I baptized him in the river Jordan, and saw the Ruach HaKodesh descending upon him in the form of a dove. Hmm. Yeah, okay. And a dove, and heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now while I was going before him, I came down hither to acquaint you that the Son of Elohim will next visit us. And as the day spring from on high will come to us who are in darkness in the shadow of death. But when the first man, our father Adam, heard these things, that Yahushua was baptized in Jordan, he called out to his son Seth and said, Declare to your sons, the patriarchs and prophets, all those things which thou didst hear from Michael, the archangel, when I sent thee to the gates of paradise to entreat Elohim that he would anoint my head when I was sick. Then saith, uh, then Seth, Coming near to the patriarchs and prophets, said, I, Seth, when I was praying to Elohim at the gates of paradise, beheld the angel of Yahuwah. Michael appeared unto me, saying, I am sent unto thee from Yahuwah. I am appointed to preside over human bodies. I tell thee, Seth, do not pray to Elohim in tears, and entreat him for the oil of the tree of mercy wherewith to anoint thy father Adam for his headache, because thou canst not by any means obtain it till the last days and times, namely till 5,500 years be passed. Then will Mashiach, the most merciful son of Elohim, come on earth to raise again the human body of Adam, and at the same time to raise the bodies of the dead, and when he cometh he will be baptized in the Jordan. Then with the oil of his mercy he will anoint all those who believe on him, and the oil of his mercy will continue to future generations for those who shall be born of the water and the Ruach ha HaKodesh unto eternal life. And when at that time the most merciful son of Elohim, Mashiach Yehusha, shall come down on earth, he will introduce our father Adam into paradise to, to the tree of mercy. When all the patriarchs and prophets heard all these things from Seth, they rejoiced the more. All right, I'm going to pause right here. And I'm going to read from our first second witness. Um, this is a really interesting passage from the book of Adam. Uh, this, yeah, the book of Adam. All right. The book of Adam, chapter 4, um, excuse me, the book of Adam, chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. Yeah. Okay, here we go. This is not to be uh, right now, but in the future times. Okay, so this here is the angel, who was it? It was angel Michael, right? Yeah. So the angel Michael is speaking. It's the same scene that he just described. Seth has gone to paradise to get um, this anointing oil for his father, Adam, and he's being spoken to here by the archangel. And this is what the archangel is telling him. This is, uh, this is not to be right now, but in the future times when 5,000 years will be completed. Then at the five and a half thousand year, the beloved son of Elohim, Messiah, will come upon the earth to resurrect Adam's body from his fall because of the transgression of the commands. He will come and he will be baptized in the river Jordan. And as soon as he will have come forth from the uh, forth from of the water with the anointing of oil, he will anoint him 
and all his descendants so that they will raise so that they will rise at the time of the resurrection. Yahuwah said, I will admit them into paradise and I will anoint them with that unction. So here we see almost a direct quote from the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, and then one more in the book of Adam, uh, chapter 41. And Yahuwah told him, Behold, as I told you, you are soil and you have returned to the soil, but I will raise you up in the resurrection, which I have promised you at the time of resurrection. So that prophecy that was given to Adam at the very beginning um, is now coming coming, uh, uh, coming to fruition at this point. I'm sorry, guys. I'm kind of slurring right now. I'm reading through a lot of my notes. Um, let me read a couple here from the Revelation of Moshe. This one, okay, Revelation of Moshe. Then Yahuwah said to Adam, Thou shalt not now take of it, for it has been assigned to the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turneth to guard it on account of thee, that thou mayest not taste of it and be free from death forever, but that thou mayest have the war which the enemy has set in thee. But when thou art gone out of paradise, if thou shalt keep thyself from all evil and being destined to die, I will raise again raise thee up when the resurrection comes. And then there shall be given thee of the tree of life, and thou shalt be free from death forever. And again we read, And Elohim called Adam and said, Adam, Adam. And the, uh, at this point in the Revelation of Moshe, Adam is actually dead, and he's calling to him from Sheol. Um, and the body answered out of the ground and said, Here am I, Adonai. And Yahuwah says to him, I said to thee, Dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. Again, I promise thee the resurrection. I will raise thee up in the last day in the resurrection, in every man who is of thy seed. So it appears that this prophecy that is given forth um, in these books is coming to pass that this is like the last days when, I don't know, Sheol is being emptied out and the resurrection is happening. Let me read another passage. Hopefully I'm not losing everybody. Let me read another interesting passage from the Odes of Solomon. And this is Ode number 15. Let's see if I'm reading this right. Let's see. No. Okay. Let me read uh, the Odes of Solomon 42. This one is really interesting. This is written as past tense. And it's from the perspective of Yahusha, okay? I stretch out my hands and approach my Adonai, for the stretching of my hands is his sign. My, um, so that I, in the Odes of Solomon, the stretching forth of the hands is the sign of the cross. It's not like in a Catholic sense. It's actually like you stretch out your hands on both sides. That's the sign of the, um, his sign. My expansion is the outspread tree which was set up on the way of the righteous one. And I became of no account to those who did not take hold of me, and I shall be with those who love me. All my persecutors are dead, and they sought after me who hoped in me because I was alive. And I rose up and am with them, and I will speak by their mouths. For they have despised those who persecuted them. And I lifted up over them the yoke of my love, like the arm of the bridegroom over the bride. So was my yoke over those who, that know me. And as the couch that is spread in the house of the bridegroom and bride, so is my love over those that believe in me. And I was not rejected, though I was reckoned to be so. I did not perish, though they devised it against me. Sheol, so this is where we see Ahusha enter Sheol, Sheol. Sheol saw me and was made miserable. Death cast me up and many along with me. I had gall and bitterness, and I went down with him to the utmost of his death, depth. And the feet and the head he let go, for they were not able to endure my face. And I made a congregation of living men among his dead men, and I spake with them by living lips, because my words shall not be void. And those who had died ran towards me. So he's in Sheol, and he's saying, And those who had died ran towards me, and they cried and said, Son of Elohim, have pity on us, and do with us according to thy kindness. And bring us out from the bonds of darkness, and open to us the door by which we shall come out to thee. For we see that our death has not touched thee. 
Let us be also be redeemed with thee, for thou art our Redeemer. And I heard their voice, and my name I sealed upon their heads, for they are free men, and they are mine. All right, for that's Odes of Solomon. So if you guys have any questions or any comments, feel free to jump in. I'm just going to keep reading. Hopefully this is not... Um, all right, let's keep reading. Chapter 5. This is, I, I love the scene here with Satan. While all the saints were rejoicing, behold, Satan, the prince and captain of death, said to the prince of Sheol, prepared to receive Yahushua of Nazareth himself, who boasted that he was the son of Elohim, and yet was a man afraid of death, and said, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Besides, he did many injuries to me and to many others, for those whom I made blind and lame, and those also whom I tormented with several devils. He cured by his word, yea, and those whom I brought dead to thee, he by force takes away from thee. To this the prince of Sheol replied to Satan, Who is that so powerful prince, and yet a man who is afraid of who is afraid of death? For all the uh, potent, potentate, I don't even know how to pronounce that, potentes of the earth are subject to my power, whom thou broughtest to subjection by thy power. But if he, if he be so powerful in his human nature, I affirm to thee for truth that he is almighty in his divine nature, and no man can resist his power. When therefore he said he was afraid of death, he designed to ensnare thee, and, it, and unhappy it will be to thee for everlasting ages. If you're not pay, if you're not following here, Satan is actually Satan has actually been beguiled here. He's the beguiler, but in this case, he has actually been tricked into crucifying Messiah, and he actually didn't know who he was. Um, and before people start saying that Satan did know who he was, um, I'll be reading from multiple texts here that, in fact, he did not know. And this is why he goes and tries to tempt him. He's trying to feel him out. Like, who is this guy? He's following him around. You know, Yahushua's like, you know, get from, you know, get from behind thee and so on and so forth. Um, and... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get more into it, but let's keep reading. Then Satan replying said to the Prince of Sheol. So like the Prince of Sheol, he knows who this guy is. He knows who the Messiah is, and Satan is still oblivious. So then Satan replying said to the Prince of Sheol, Why didst thou express a doubt, and was afraid to receive that Yahushua of Nazareth, both thy adversary and mine? So apparently Satan just thinks he's like a great prophet, like all the rest. As for me, I tempted him and stirred up my old people, the Yahudim. He calls the Yahudim his people, interesting, with zeal and anger against him. I sharpened the spear for his suffering. I mixed the gall and vinegar and commanded that he should drink it. I prepared the cross to crucify him and the nails to pierce through his hands and feet. And now his death is near at hand. I will bring him hither, subject both to thee and me. Then the prince of Sheol answering said, Thou saidst to me just now that he took away the dead from me by force. They who have been kept here till they should live again upon earth were taken away hence, not by their own power, but by prayers made to Elohim, and their mighty Elohim took them from me. Who then is that Yahushua of Nazareth that by his word have taken away the dead from me without prayer to Elohim? Perhaps it is the same who took away from me Lazarus. After he had been four days dead, and did both stink and was rotten, and of whom I had possession as a dead person, yet he brought him to life again by his power. Satan answering, replied to the prince of Sheol, It is the very same person, Yahushua of Nazareth. He's like totally oblivious, oblivious here. Which when the prince of Sheol heard, he said to him, I adjure thee by the powers which belong to thee and me, that thou bring him not to me. So he's trying to like, so Satan is trying to bring Yahusha into Sheol and the prince of Sheol is like, no, get, get him out of here. Like, do not let him in. You don't understand what you're doing, what this guy is going to do. For when I heard of the power of his word, I trembled for fear and all my impious company were at the same time disturbed. And we were not able to detain Lazarus. But he gave himself a shake, and with all the signs of malice, he immediately went away from us. And the earth, the very earth in which the dead body of Lazarus was lodged, presently turned him out alive. And I know now that he is Almighty Elohim who could perform such things, who is mighty in his dominion, and mighty in his human nature, who is the Savior of mankind. Bring not therefore this person hither, for he will set at liberty all those whom I hold in prison under unbelief. 
and bound with the fetter of their sins and will conduct them to everlasting life. All right, so I'm going to pause here and I'm going to go to the uh, Ascension of Isaiah. And this, this um, talks about how one of the reasons that, that uh, Satan, here known as Beliar, uh, Beliar, actually has Isaiah sawed asunder is because he's furious at all the things that Isaiah prophesied in his book about Messiah. But the ascension of Isaiah makes clear one of the things that Satan was so upset about was the fact that he himself would be beguiled and not know who the Messiah was, even though he was prophesied about. It's almost a, it's a, it, like poetic justice in a way. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I find it so amusing that you have Satan here thinking he's brought this, this, this great prophet down to Sheol and <laughs> The prince of Sheol is uh, definitely telling him, no, 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 we, I don't want him down here. He's already caused uh, some power happening, power grab here. And the last thing I want to do is have him down here. So it is, it, I just found that so amusing uh, when you read this, this dialogue between them. And, uh, uh, but yeah, what you're going to explain next is going to be great. So this comes from the Ascension of Isaiah, chapter 9. I'll read this first and then another uh, quick chapter from it. <clears throat> and this is talking about, well, let's see what this has to say. I took these notes earlier today, so I thought they might be important. And the Elohim of that world will stretch forth his hand against the sun. So the God of that world, who's that? We know who that is. And they will crucify him on a tree. So here it's saying that the Elohim of this world is personally responsible for crucifying Messiah upon the tree and will slay him not knowing who he is. So it's so the Yahudim are crucifying Mashiach. They don't know who he is. They're speaking for their father, Satan. Yahushua has already said their father, Satan. Their father, Satan, does not know who he is. And thus, his descent, as you will see, his descent to Sheol, will be hidden even from the heavens. I'm sorry, I, I misquoted that. His descent from the heavens, as you will see, will be hidden ev even from the heavens, so that it will not be known who he is. And when he hath plundered the angel of death, who is the angel of death, he will ascend on the third day, and he will remain in that world 545 days. I'm not so sure about what that means. And then many of the righteous will ascend with him, uh, whose ruachs do not receive their garments till Adonai Mashiach ascend, and they ascend with him. Then indeed they will receive their garments and thrones and crowns when he has ascended into the, into the seventh heaven. So these, um, yeah, so many of these saints at the time he ascends to heaven, these saints are taken out of Sheol, according to the ascension of Isaiah, and brought to heaven. So let's read one more passage from the, the Ascension of Isaiah. This comes from chapter 11. And I saw in Nazareth, he sucked the breast as a babe, and as is customary in order that he might not be recognized. Um, okay, so let me back up. So it talks about how Yahushua, when he came down to be incarnate, to go into Mary, that as he was descending through each of the seven layers of heaven, that he kept lowering his stature so that none of the angels recognized who he was. Nobody saluted him in any of the, of the, the six lower heavens. And then when he gets below the firmament, uh, where all the, the demons and the fallen angels are there arguing and fighting all the time, uh, nobody saluted him. Like Nobody even knew who he was. They had no idea that Mashiach was coming down to earth. All right? All right, so he's... So he comes down as a baby and and nobody recognizes him. And when he had grown up, he worked great signs and wonders in the land of Israel and of Jerusalem. And after this, the adversary envied him and roused the children of Israel against him. So Satan clearly hates him. He envies him, uh, but he has no idea again who he is. Not know, And then it says, not knowing who he was. And they delivered him to the king and crucified him. And he descended to the angels to the angel of Sheol. In Jerusalem, indeed, I was him being crucified um, on a tree, and likewise after the third day, rise again and remain days. 
The way that's written is a little confusing. But And the angel who conducted me said, understand Isaiah. And I saw when he sent out the 12 apostles and ascended. You notice how they never talk about the 13th apostle in any of these. I know that's maybe a little below the belt, but I always find that interesting that they only ever, all these books only talk about 12, not the 13th. But. And I saw him and he was in the firmament, but he had not changed himself into their form. And all the angels of the firmament and the Satan saw him and they worshiped. And there was much sorrow there while they said, so he's actually, so what it's describing now is Yahusha is ascending back up to heaven after being resurrected from the dead, after being on the earth for 40 days. And all of a sudden, now he's in his glory and all the Satans, all the fallen angels below the firmament, um, they're looking at him and they're like, how did you get past us? We never saw you the first time. And there was much sorrow there while they said, how did our Adonai descend in our midst? And re we perceived not the glory which has been upon him, which we, uh, which we see has been upon him from the sixth heaven. All right. So there's some stuff there. So let's get back into this. Um, chapter 16. Is everyone still doing all right? Everyone hanging in there? All right. Um, I'm not sure how far we're going to get tonight, but I want to get through the Sheol section. Chapter 16. And while Satan and the prince of Sheol were discussing this to each other, on a sudden there was a voice as of thunder and the rushing of wind saying, Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall come in. When the prince of Sheol heard this, he said to Satan, Depart from me and be gone out of my habitations. If thou art a powerful warrior, fight with the king of glory. But what hast thou to do with him? And he cast him forth from his habitations. And the prince said to his impious, uh, impious officers, Shut the brass gates of cruelty and make them fast with iron bars and fight courageously, lest we be taken captives. But when, the, when all the company of the saints heard this, they spake with a loud voice of anger to the prince of Sheol. Open thy gates that the king of glory may come in. And the, div and the divine prophet David cried out saying, Did not I when on earth truly prophesy and say, Oh, that men would praise Yahuwah for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron and sunder. He hath taken them because of their iniquity and because of their unrighteousness they are afflicted. After this another prophet, namely Holy Yeshiahu, spake in like manner to all the saints. Did not I rightly prophesy to you when I was alive on earth? The dead men shall live, and they shall rise again who are in the graves, and they shall rejoice who are in earth. For the dew which is from Yahuwah shall bring ever uh, deliverance to them. And I said in another place, O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? When all the saints heard these things spoken by Isaiah, or Yashiahu, they said to the prince of Sheol, Open now thy gates, and take away thine iron bars, for thou wilt not be bound, and have no power. Then there was a great voice, as the sound of thunder, saying, Lift up your gates, O princes, and be lifted up, ye gates of Sheol, and the king of glory will enter in. The prince of Sheol, perceiving the same voice repeated, cried out as though he had been ignorant, Who is that king of glory? David replied to the prince of Sheol, and said, I understand the words of that voice because I spake them by his Ruach. And now, as I have above said, I say unto thee, Yahuwah strong and powerful, Yahuwah mighty in battle. He is the king of glory, and he is Yahuwah in heaven and in earth. He hath looked down to hear the groans of the prisoners and to set loose those that are appointed to death. And now, thou filthy and stinking prince of Sheol, open thy gates that the king of glory may enter in, for he is Yahuwah of heaven and earth. While David was saying this, the mighty Adonai appeared in the form of a man and enlightened those places which had ever before been in darkness, and broke asunder the fetters which before could not be broken, and with his invincible power visited those who sat in the deep darkness by iniquity, and the shadow of death by sin. Chapter 17 <clears throat> Impious death and her cruel officers hearing these things were seized with fear in their several kingdoms when they saw the clearness of the light and Mashiach himself on a sudden appearing in their habitations. They cried out therefore and said, we are bound by thee. 
Thou seemest to intend our confusion before Yahuwah. Who art thou who has no sign of corruption, but thou bright appearance which is full proof of thy greatness, of which yet thou seemest to take no notice? Who art thou so powerful and so weak, so great and so little, a man and yet a soldier of the first rank, who can command in the form of a servant as a common soldier, the king of glory dead and alive, the once slain upon the cross? Who layest dead in the grave, and art come down alive to us? And in thy death all the creatures trembled, and all the stars were moved. And now hast thou thy liberty among the dead, and givest disturbance to our legions. Who art thou who dost release the captives that were held in chains by original sin, and bringest them into their former liberty? Who art thou who dost spread so glorious and divine a light over those who were made blind by the darkness of sin? In like manner, all the legions of devils were seized with the like horror, and with the most submissive fear cried out and said, Whence comes it, O thou Yahusha Mashiach, that thou art a man so powerful and glorious in majesty, so bright as to have no spot, and so pure as to have no crime? For that lower world of earth, which was ever till now subject to us, and from whence we received tribute, never sent us such a dead man before, never sent such presence as these to the princes of Sheol, who therefore art thou, who with such courage and uh, interest among our abodes, and art not only not afraid to threaten us with the greatest punishments, but also endeavorous to rescue all others from the chains in which we hold them. Perhaps thou art that Yahusha, of whom Satan just now spoke to our prince, that by the death of the cross thou went about to receive the power of death. Then the king of glory, trampling upon death, seized the prince of Sheol, deprived him of all his power, and took our earthly father Adam with him to his glory. So here we see that the promise he made to Adam was that, I mean, he, he prophesied in the very beginning to Adam that he's coming just for him and Sheol. Like everyone else was a bonus. He came for his children too. but. He came just for his friend, Adam. That's the first guy he came and rescued. That's a really cool picture right there. Um, let me see if I could just pull out a few more of my notes before reading on. Let's see. I could read from the Gospel of Bartholomew. Um, oh, here's an interesting one from the Gospel of Kepha. And just so everyone knows, I am not holding the lost Gospel of Peter um, up as a scripture. Uh, I, I use it in the loosest of terms. And in fact, I actually kind of agree with some of the historians on this one that it, it whoever wrote the Gospel of Peter was actually writing not based on any other text, but actually based on an oral tradition. Uh, it, it's still considered one of the earliest Gospels, but it's really interesting, this idea that it was based just on oral tradition by what uh, followers of Mashiach were saying. And it says this uh, really quickly in chapter 10. When therefore those soldiers, soldiers saw it, uh, they awakened the centurion and the elders, for they too were hard by keeping guard. So these are the soldiers before the tomb. And as they declared what things they had seen, again, they see three men come forth from the tomb and two of them supporting one. So there's two angels supporting Yahusha as he's coming forth from the tomb and a cross following them. And of the two, the, the head reached unto the heaven, but the head of him who was led by them overpassed the heavens. And they heard a voice from the heaven. So there's, there's a, the, I think it's called the Beth Kol, that the voice is coming from the heavens. And it says, as Yahushua comes out of the tomb, uh, thou has preached to them that sleep. It's almost like a, like a, like a question. Have you preached to those that sleep? And a response was heard from uh, the cross, yay. So I think that was kind of kind of a cool little uh, note there that in the, in the Gospel of Peter, it's given this example that they, uh, the people in Sheol were asleep, and he went there and he woke them up. All right, continuing on, verse 18. Trudging on ahead. Thank you for being good soldiers tonight. Then the prince of Sheol took Satan and with great indi indication said to him, O thou prince of destruction, author of Beelzebub's defeat and banishment, the scorn of Elohim's angels, and loathed by all righteous persons, 
What inclined thee to act thus? Thou wouldst crucify the King of glory, and by his destruction has made us promises of very large advantages, but as a fool were ignorant of what thou was about. For behold, now that Yahusha of Nazareth, with the brightness of his glorious divinity, puts to flight all the horrid powers of darkness and death. He has broken down our prisons from top to bottom, dismissed all the captives, released all who were bound, and all who uh, were wont formerly to groan under the weight of their torments have now insulted us, and we are like to be defeated by their prayers. Our impious dominions are subdued, and no part of mankind is now left in our subjection. But on the other hand, they all boldly defy us. Now, keep in mind here, um, according to this, it sounds like all of humanity has been emptied out of Sheol. Like he's coming to get everybody out. It even says those who were tormented there are now insulting them. And it says, um, yeah, all who were bound and all who were, were want formally to groan under the weight of their torments, they're, they're all gone now. So, like, he has completely emptied out this this chamber and shield. I don't know where everyone goes. I'm not sure that's ever explained in this book. Uh, but that's kind of interesting to note, that death itself was completely emptied out. Our, uh, our dominions are subdued, and no part of mankind is now left in our subjection. So there you go. But on the other hand, they all boldly defy us. Though before, the dead never durst behave themselves insolently towards us, nor being prisoners could ever on any occasion be merry. O Satan, thou prince of all the wicked, father of the impious and abandoned, why wouldst thou attempt this exploit, seeing our prisoners were hitherto always without the least hopes of salvation in life? But now there is not one of them does ever grow, nor is there the least appearance of a tear in any of their faces. O Prince Satan, thou great keeper of the infernal regions, all the advantages which thou didst acquire by the forbidden tree and the loss of paradise, thou hast now, lo now lost by the wood of the cross. So we know that Satan was, uh, in, and I think I pointed out in the past, I don't have it in front of me, that <clears throat> uh, Satan was, you know, he was in a throne, he was enthroned in paradise. He was, of course, removed from paradise. And then the prophecy was made that Adam, after Adam fell, the prophecy was made that Adam would actually sit on Satan's throne in paradise. And, and here we see that Yahu, uh, Yahusha, the word of Yahuwah, has, has twisted Satan to his advantage, where he has now used Satan. We know he's using Satan, but he has used him in his crucifixion of him to, to you know, to bring Adam back to paradise and have him sit on his own throne. So that's kind of interesting. And thy happiness all then expired, which thou didst crucify Yahushua Mashiach, the king of glory. Thou hast acted against thine own interests and mine, as thou wilt presently perceive by those large torments and infinite punishments which thou art able about to suffer. O Satan, prince of all evil, author of death, and source of all pride, thou shalt first have inquired into the evil crimes of Yahushua of Nazareth, and that then thou wouldst have found that he was guilty of no fault worthy of death. Why did thou venture without either reason or justice to crucify him, and has brought down to our regions a person innocent and righteous, and thereby has lost all the sinners, impious, impious, and unrighteous persons in the whole world? While the prince of Sheol was thus speaking to Satan, the king of glory said to Beelzebub, the prince of Sheol, Satan, the prince... Uh, the prince shall be subject to thy dominion forever, and the room of Adam uh, and his righteous sons who are mine. All right. Um, I'm wondering if this is a good place to stop tonight, because we're kind of coming up on the hour. Does anyone have any questions, observations? You guys have been hanging in there really good tonight. Thank you for reading this with me. I, I I wanted to just say that uh, when you mentioned uh, Bel Belair, uh, when you when you look at that name is you can look at it as Belair, and he's also called Belial, uh, and I believe also uh, Belzebub too. 
I got different names for the Prince of of Sheol. Yeah. You know, I just realized we only have four chapters. Four chapters left. to go. I think we could do this, guys. I think we could we could charge through this. I thank you for reading this book with me. This is one of my favorite extra biblical reads. So, can I ask you a question, real quick? Yes, I recognize that voice. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering about your like the Earth is a womb idea. Do you think that the first resurrection, since it, they everybody was birthed, that the Earth had to refill? with souls before it'll happen a second time? See, th that's a really good question. And I, I was asking my research partner, my wife, this very question today, because we read this book together. And I'd have to, it might be answered in the next four chapters. I don't know. I mean, I, I was asking today, does the whole process start again? Like, after Sheol is emptied, does does it start to feel, uh, fill back up again? And then they have to wait on the, the resurrection in the future. I don't know. I can't answer that. Like, have the rules changed now? Because if anyone knew me a few years ago, I was a diehard soul sleeper. Like, when you die, you're going to sleep. You're going down in the tomb. You're going to sleep, and you're waiting on the, the blast of the trumpet. Uh, which is what, of course, you know, Paul talks about as well in his epistle. Um. And so I don't know. I don't know if, if when I die, I'm going to go back to Shul and I'm going to wait down there, or if the this if this is another clearly this is another uh, character of the Savior, right? He has saved his people from death from Shul, and so according to this book and all the others that I've been pulling up for the research of tonight, um, I have like many pages of notes here of just different scripture verses. I'm reading from the same event, it appears as though this was it. Like if you are um uh one of the set apart that this was a that this was the end days event. You, you guys know where I'm at. Like we are like in the end, 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 end of the end days. This here what we're reading, that was the end days. And um you know the end of history and the dead were delivered from Shul. So I it, it sounds to me like like, I have to change some of my theology, my doctrines, according to a lot of these books I'm reading, and we really maybe do go to paradise when we die. It, I think that's very plausible. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but it seems like that's what you were getting at. So did I did I get yeah. that right? And Gypsy was kind of asking the same thought I had, which is like, what is what do you think happens to unbelievers? Like, do they literally just die? Like they just die and they're dead and that's Perish. it. Well, that that's a that's a whole nother uh, discussion I can go into about um, because I I do see scripture verses that uh, according to Enoch, uh, according to Daniel, and I actually have a paper coming out about six weeks from now on this very subject. Does everybody? Um, does everybody resurrect for judgment? And I have some questions on that that I can't totally answer. But it does seem like if everybody has to be judged, that um, that people have to go to some holding cell until that happens. Like they have to. So I I don't know. I don't know how to answer all that. And that's just something that it's worth seeking out. So. Yeah. I want to add to that is in chapter 15, verse 20, he gives a, he gives a, a hint here. Bring not therefore this person hither, for he will set at liberty all those whom I hold in prison under unbelief. So he's holding them unbelief. Yahushua goes down, frees everyone. And I would presume that all the new the new uh souls that go down there he's going to be able to hold them on the un unbelieving ones i would presume okay that that's that makes a lot of sense Th yeah thank you for bringing that up that was good um and i wanted to yeah sure. you go ahead uh yahusha also like uh specifically says uh that uh, people come to him and say you know adonai adonai when when we do all these things in your name, 
etc etc and they'll say I know you're not so they're definitely it's definitely not just righteous people who are going to be in that kind of situation like it's definitely people who think they're righteous or maybe people who I don't know maybe have an op like a different opportunity like because it's a tough thing to to say that you know oh there's there there's definitely importance in these types of things and pursuing righteousness which is pursuing you know uh, obedience to Torah and then you know you have all every every single person the, the answer is or, or the response is almost always the same it's like well what about my great grandfather or what about my uncle who you know they did all these things they fed the poor they were you know they they were super generous and you know they they they, they tried to live by the Ten Commandments but they didn't and they didn't know that they needed to live by Torah so I just I, I can't really imagine like a just Elohim would just like be like no they're they're perishing just like everybody else I imagine there'd be some some sort of yeah like judging their heart or something like that yeah I agree so yeah we uh, can't presume to know the conversation between the most high the father and all right. his children even up to last moment to the last breath yeah and i do want to say that we have a few more chapters to read so i think we'll get more insight on some some of this too and we also read in chapter 17 it's it's talking about uh death and and her cruel officers hearing these things were seized with fear in their several kingdoms so it's a large place so I'm not going to read from the Gospel of Bartholomew, uh, just for sake of time, but just know that it's a, maybe we'll do that one week. It's a much shorter read, and it's fascinating. I really like the Gospel of Bartholomew. It gives this exact same scene that yeah. Yahusha, goes to, Yahusha goes down to Sheol, and uh, the, the Prince of Sheol is there arguing with Satan. How dare you let him in? How, how could you be such a buffoon to do this? The exact same scene. There's also one more that's worth commenting on here. Uh, this is the Book of the Resurrection of Mashiach by Bartholomew, uh, purportedly written by Bartholomew. Again, poor Bartholomew, anything this guy, anything attributed to this guy's name doesn't make it in canon or anything. But um, uh, I don't have the... Uh, the book is so rare that all we have is cliff notes on it. Um, we don't actually have a translation of it, which is kind of sad, even though we have the documents. So there's no translation of it. But apparently there's uh, the uh, death himself, uh, the Prince of Sheol. He actually, when Yahushua dies, he feels like this disturbance, like this terrible disturbance, like something really bad just happened. So he goes up to the tomb of Yahusha, and it says he has six sons with him, and they're all serpents. So that's kind of interesting. It's describing that they're they're like reptilians, like the, you know, like seraphim. Uh, these serpents they go up to the tomb, and they actually they um, they start asking him questions, like his corpse. Like he hasn't gone down to Sheol yet, and they start asking, like, "Who are you?" and um, and I think he, let's see, I'm trying to figure out. Um, apparently, oh, he doesn't answer who he is, but Yahusha basically, keep in mind, this is his corpse. He's dead, but his corpse, I guess, laughs at, uh, at the Prince of Sheol, and they flee and go back. And so then Satan goes and gets him to bring him down, and he's like, what have you done? Um, so it's when he, apparently, according to this text, it's when he goes to his tomb, he figures out, like, okay, this is the Shiok here. So that's worth mentioning. It's kind of a cool little passage. All right. Chapter 19. Let's finish this. We can charge through. We can do this. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Chapter 19. Then Yahushua stretched forth his hand and said, Come to me, all my set apart, who were created in my image, who were condemned by the tree of forbidden fruit and by the devil and death. Live now by the wood of my cross. The devil, the prince of this world, is overcome, and death is conquered. So. I mean, it seems like that answers the question right there. Death is conquered, right? So um, if I'm to take this, and the guys, I've, I've been changing my doctrine on this because I was really like a diehard soul sleeper. If this is correct, and the multitude of books that seem to agree with this, uh, maybe they're all wrong. I don't know. Maybe this we shouldn't be reading this. But according to this, we can't be chained down by death anymore. 
It's been conquered. Then presently all the saints were joined together under the hand of the Most High Elohim. So they're, now they're, they're under the hand of the Most High, Yahuwah. And Adonai Yahusha laid hold on Adam's hand and said to him, Shalom be to thee, and all thy righteous po uh, posterity, which is mine. Then Adam, casting himself at the feet of Yahusha, addressed himself to him with tears and humble language and a loud voice, saying, I will extol thee, O Adonai, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Adonai, my Elohim, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Adonai, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto Yahuwah all ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness, for his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. In like manner all the set apart, prostrate at the feet of Yahusha, said with one voice, Thou art come, O Redeemer of the world, and has actually accomplished all things, which thou didst foretell by the law and the holy prophets. Thou hast redeemed the living by the cross, and art come down to us, that by the death of the cross thou mightst deliver us from Sheol, and by the power from death. O Adonai, as thou hast put the ensigns of the glory in heaven, and has set up the sign of thy redemption, even thy cross on earth. So, Adonai, set the sign of the, the victory of thy cross in Sheol, that, that death may have dominion no longer. That's kind of interesting. Then Adonai, stretching forth his hand, made the sign of the cross upon Adam and set up all his saints. Now, I know that a lot of you guys, this is going to be some huge red flags, because you're like, okay, I'm seeing like the sign of the cross all over this. Um, and that's something we could discuss as a group. Um, I, even a couple years ago, I was very much, you know, I kind of, it was like, it was a tree people. <laughs> he died on a tree, uh, which I believe he did die on a tree, by the way, that the, the, the gospels clearly say a cross, there was a cross beam that they, they put on the tree. Um, but we can discuss this and see what you guys think about this. And taking hold of Adam by his right hand, he ascended from Sheol, and all the saints of Elohim followed him. Then the royal prophet David boldly cried and said, O oh, sing unto Yahuwah a new song, for he, doth, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Yahuwah hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly shown in the sight of the heathen. And the whole multitude of saints answered, saying, This honor have all his saints. Amen. Praise ye Yahuwah. Afterwards, the prophet Habakkuk cried out and said, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation of thy people. And all the saints said, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of Yahuwah, for Yahuwah hath enlightened us. This is our Elohim forever and ever. He shall reign over us to everlasting ages. Amen. In like manner, all the prophets spake the sacred things of his praise and followed him. Chapter 20. Then Adonai, holding Adam by the hand, delivered him to Michael the archangel, and he led them into paradise filled with mercy and glory. And of course, where is um, paradise but in the third heaven, out of the, the seven heavens? And, uh, you know, that's obviously where the garden originally was. And two very ancient men met them and were asked by the saints, Who are ye who have not yet been with us in Sheol and have had your bodies placed in paradise? One of them answering said, I am Enoch, who was translated by the word of Elohim. And this man who is with me is Elijah the Tishbite, who was translated in a fiery chariot. Here we have hitherto been, and have not tasted death, but are now about to return at the coming of Antichrist, being armed with divine signs and miracles to engage with him in battle, and to be slain by him at Jerusalem, and to be taken up alive again into the clouds after three days and a half. Now, I want to point out here, guys, that... I have pointed out repeatedly that the New Testament, uh, the books we know as the New Testament, were written in haste. They were written like, this is all about to go down now. Like, it's, it's, it's going down. The Antichrist is here, going to be here in our generation. Even Paul prophesied that he would be taken up. Like, they all believed it was them. And notice what they say here. Um, let's see. But... Are now we are now about to return at the coming of Antichrist. Even they're saying that it's about to go down. 
Like we're getting ready to go down there. So I just want to point that out. Like they're not saying here that we're getting ready. We're about getting ready to go down in 2000 years from now. Like, you know, I, I, you guys know my view that, that all these things have transpired. So, and while the Holy Enoch and Elias were relating this, behold, there came another man in a miserable figure carrying the sign of the cross upon his shoulders. Now, I don't know what the sign of the cross upon his shoulders is here. Um, I did point out to you that um, according to the Odes of Solomon, I read several in there where they talk about stretching out their, their hands side to side. Like it was like something that the the early messianic believers dead that they would they would say that's the sign of the cross and they would stretch out their hands like they're um like they're giving their lives to him freely like you know i'm stretching out my arms because it's my life is yours to to uh, to to take and when all the saints saw him they said to him who art thou for thy countenance is like a thief's and why dost thou carry a cross upon thy shoulders for which he answering said Ye say right, for I was a thief who committed all sorts of wickedness upon earth. And the Yahudim crucified me with Yahushua, and I observed the surprising things which happened in the creation of the crucifixion of Adonai Yahushua. And I believed him to be the creator of all things and the Almighty King, and I prayed to him, saying, Adonai, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I never thought of that before, that he was actually praying to him on the cross. But that's, that's kind of, I like how he said that there, that he was actually praying to him. He presently regarded my supplication and said to me, Verily I say unto thee, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. So there you go, the war of the comma. I was actually wrong about that. I actually got on Rob Skiba's uh, <laughs> show once and argued that he did not mean that it would be that day, that it would be like a future event. But I've now, I have now uh, bowed my head on that point and recognized that uh, it, pro it was th indeed that day. And he gave me this sign of the cross, saying, Carry this and go to paradise. And if the angel who is the guard of paradise will not admit thee, show him the sign of the cross and say to him, Yahushua HaMashiach, who is now crucified, has sent me hither to thee. So again, that should answer everyone's question. And this can be the big red flag. Uh, <laughs> if, if the sign of the cross is too much for you, um, then, you know, throw this book out. But according to this, the sign of the cross is what admits you into paradise. So... When I did this and told the angel who is the guard of paradise all these things, and he heard them, he presently opened the gates, introduced me, and placed me on the right hand in paradise, saying, Stay here a little time till Adam, the father of all mankind, shall enter in with all his sons, who are the holy and righteous servants of Yahushua HaMashiach, who is crucified. So that's kind of a cool picture that um, we saw the same thing with when, uh, when Abel was uh, killed, the earth refused to bury him because the first person to be buried in the earth was Adam. And and then Adam, you know, a long time later was buried there. So we see the same picture here where the angel's like, look, look, I can give you, I can let you in. He's like the, the, the bouncer at the club, you know, the doorman. He's like, look, I can let you in, but we got to let Adam in first. It, he, he's the first to enter. Once he gets in, I can, you know, I can let you slide in. All right. Um, okay. When they heard all this account from the thief, all the patriarchs said with one voice, blessed be thou, O um, almighty Elohim, the father, father of everlasting goodness and the father of mercies, who has shown such favor to those who were sinners against them and has brought them to the mercy of paradise and has placed them amidst thy large and spiritual provisions and a spiritual and holy life. Amen. All right, we're almost done. Two more chapters. Here we go. 21. These are the divine and sacred my mysteries which we saw and heard. I, uh, Charinus, and Lintheus are not allowed to declare the other mysteries of Elohim as the Archangel Michael ordered us. Now, so the scene here, you know, keep in mind, it's these two guys who are the sons of Simeon who held Yahushua as a baby. So they're saying these different things that, you know, the different prophets are saying. And, um, it's almost like you get this picture that they're the only ones speaking. But the way I'm reading this is that, like, that's there. That's what, like, if you guys have ever been in a conversation before, like, you've ever been a fly on the wall and you've heard like this really interesting conversation going on, and you were to recount it, you would leave out a lot of things that people said. But you're only picking up like, oh, this person said this one thing and that person said that thing. That's kind of how I'm uh, taking this. All right, verse 2. 
saying, Ye shall go with my brethren to Jerusalem and shall continue in prayers, declaring and glorifying the resurrection of Yahushua Mashiach, seeing he hath raised you from the dead at the same time with myself, with himself. And ye shall not talk with any man, but sit as dumb persons till the time uh, come when Adonai will allow you to relate the mysteries of his divinity. The archangel Michael uh, further com commanded us to go beyond Jordan to an excellent and fat country where there are many who rose from the dead along with us for the proof of the resurrection of Mashiach. So this is just one of those accounts. Like we all know that people resurrected. It says so in Matthew. It's like, well, what happened to all these people? And here they're, they're all hanging out in this area beyond Jordan, um, all talking about their experiences. For we have only three days allowed us from the dead who arose to celebrate the Passover of our Adonai with our parents and to bear our testimony for Mashiach Adonai. And we have been baptized in the holy river of Jordan, and now they are not seen by anyone. This is as much as Elohim allowed us to relate to you. Give ye therefore praise and honor to him and repent, and he will have mercy upon you. Peace be to you from Adonai Elohim Yahushua Mashiach and the Savior of us all. Amen, amen, amen. What just occurred to me is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And remember what Yahushua said. He said that uh, in the parable that when Abraham is confronting the rich man, and the rich man, he's not being repentant at all. Of all, at all. He, because we know he's not being repentant because he's demanding that Lazarus come down and bring him water from heaven. Because he's like, why does Lazarus, des he doesn't deserve to be up there. He, he should be bringing me water, right? He hasn't repented. But he wants to go back and, and warn his friends, like any person who is, um, an, uh, um, uh, What's the word? Like if you're um, not an alcoholic, but um, uh, he's a, he's an addict. Like any true addict, um, he hates he hates um, his condition, but there's nowhere else he would rather be. But Abraham says a really fascinating statement. He said that if they don't listen to Moses, then they won't listen to you. And that's the big thing that the church seems to overlook. They, like, if they're not willing to listen to what Moses says in Torah, you can rise from the dead and you can go back and speak to them. They're not going to listen to you. And this is exactly what we're seeing. Like it, it, like his, pro, his parable is coming true in a way. These aren't wicked men coming back. They're righteous men. But they're telling them about the scene that unfolded and they still refuse to listen. Why? Because they don't believe Moses to begin with. All right. That just came to me. And after they had made an end of writing and had wrote in two distinct pieces of paper, uh, Tarnius gave what he wrote into the hands of Annas and Caiaphas and uh, Gamaliel. Lentheus likewise gave what he wrote into the hands of Nicodemus and Yosef, and immediately they were changed into exceeding white forms and were seen no more. So remember, this whole scene has, that has gone down has just been like the book of Susanna, where they have been separated and they have been writing their accounts down separately because the the Pharisees, Sadducees, so on, they want to prove them to be in error, to be lying. Um, of course, they apparently they gave the same account. But what they had wrote was found perfectly to agree. Well, there it goes. Uh, they perfectly agreed. And the one not containing one letter more or less than the other. When all the assembly of the young... I love it how like this whole book, like <laughs> they're trying to like like prove that Torah is on their side, uh, their oral law. And, and like, they're trying to like turn it on everyone. And even, you know, Pontius Pilate's turning it on them. These dead men coming, like everyone's just turning it back on them and they still refuse to believe. When all the assembly of the Yahudim heard all these surprising relations of the two of them, Charnius and Lentheus, they said to each other, truly all these things were wrought by Elohim and blessed be Adonai Yahusha forever and ever. Amen. And they went about with great concern and fear and trembling and smote upon their breasts and went away, everyone to his home. But immediately all these things which were related by the Yahudim and their synagogues concerning Yahusha were presently told by Yosef and Nicodemus to the governor. And Pilate wrote down all these transactions and placed all these accounts in the public records of his hall. Chapter 22. <clears throat> After these things, Pilate went to the temple of the Yahudim and called together all the rulers and scribes and doctors of the law and went with them into a chapel of the temple and commanding that all the gates should be shut, said to them, I have heard that ye have a certain large book in this temple. 
I desire you, therefore, that it may be brought before me. And when the great book carried by four ministers of the temple and adorned with gold and precious stones was brought, Pilate said to them all, I adjure you by the Elohim of your fathers who made and commanded this temple to be built, that ye conceal not the truth from me. Ye know all the things which are written in the book. Tell me, therefore, now, if ye in the scriptures have found anything of that Yahusha whom ye crucified, and at what time of the world he ought to have come, show it to me. Then, having sworn Annas and Caiaphas, they commanded all the rest who were with them to go out of the chapel. And they shut the gates of the temple and of the chapel, and said to Pilate, Thou hast made us to swear, O judge, by the building of this temple, to declare to thee that which is true and right. After we had crucified Yahusha, not knowing that he was the son of Elohim, but supposing he wrought his miracles by some magic arts, we summoned a large assembly in this, in this temple. And when we were deliberating among one another about the miracles which Yahusha had wrought, we found many witnesses of our own country who declared that they had seen him alive after his death, and that they heard him discoursing with his, uh, discoursing with his disciples, and saw him ascending into the heights of heaven, and entering into them. And we saw two witnesses whose bodies Yahusha raised from the dead, who told us of many strange things which Yahusha did among the dead, of which we have a written account in our hands. And it is our custom annually to open this holy book before an assembly and to search there for the council of Elohim. And we found in the first of the 70 books, huh, so the, the 70 right there, the, 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 L, uh, the LXX, where Michael the archangel is speaking to the third son of Adam, the first man, an account that after 5,500 years, Mashiach, the most beloved son of Elohim, was come on earth. And we further considered that perhaps he was the very Elohim of Israel who spoke to Moses. Thou shalt make the ark of the testimony. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. By these five cubits and a half for the building of the Ark of the Old Testament, we perceived and knew that in 5,000 years and a half, 1,000 years, Yahushua HaMashiach was to come in the Ark or Tabernacle of a body. And so our scriptures testify that he is the son of Elohim, and Adonai, and king of Israel. And because after his suffering, our chief priests were sur surprised at the signs which were wrought by his means, we open that book to search all the generations down of the generation of Yosef and Miriam, the mother of Yahusha, supposing him to be the seed of David. And we found the account of the creation, and at what time he made the heaven and the earth and the first man Adam, and that from thence to the flood were 2,000 years, 212 years. And from the flood to Abraham, 912. And from Abraham to Moses, 430. And from Moses to David, the king, 510. And from David to Babylonish captivity, 500 years. And from the Babylonian captivity to the incarnation of Messiah, 400 years. The sum of all which amounts to 5,000 and, and a half, a thousand. And so it appears that Yahushua, whom we crucified, is Yahushua Mashiach, the son of Elohim, and true and almighty Elohim. Amen. And thus concludes the reading of the Gospel of Nicodemus. Thank you, everybody, for being here to read it with me. Let me know your thoughts. No, you cannot. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this was supposed to be a Gnostic gospel, right? Well, I, I don't know. Entertain me. Why is it a Gnostic gospel? I don't know. I, I feel like that's what scholars say. They group this in with the Gnostic gospels. I'm just, I didn't hear anything like at all resembling Gnosticism, so I was just curious. But yeah, I, I've, talked to you, I've talked to you about this before, and I have a lot of questions about Gnosticism, like if that was even a real threat to the church at any given time. Um, I mean, like Gnostics by definition were going out and living in the desert, like, you know, in monasteries and caves and stuff. Like anyone who does that is not a threat to society. Uh, let's just be clear about that. But it's almost like, you know, there is, there are Gnostic texts. I mean, we could look at them. There are Gnostic texts which do not uh, uphold the law of Yahuwah. And it's all like this eternal light, you know, this eternal truth that is, you know, that only you yourself can know. But 
what they do is what scholars do is they love to just they they gnosticism is a dirty word and nobody wants to be a gnostic right and so they they do this all the time and they're like oh that's a gnostic text don't read that. that's that's gnostic you know that was found in some oh, some not gnostic library in the desert so that you know and so yeah there's there's absolutely nothing about this that is gnostic there is no hidden knowledge um there is no um, you know, eternal light, inner light that you have to search out and know for yourself, and that is the truth. It's very clear in here what the truth is. It, they talk about the law the whole time and how the law directed us to who Messiah was. So I, I didn't read a single line in there that I thought was could be defined as Gnostic. Um, I've read some Gnostic texts, and that just doesn't appear to one appear like one to me. What's really interesting is that Satan's front and center in the story. He's not hiding. Uh, Yahusha's there. So in a lot of Gnostic, Gnostic texts, these are not real figures. These are stories. And that's why in one way they were persecuted and why people then hold them up as the truth instead of realizing it that got flipped again. Because part of that truth is, once again, Satan doesn't exist. Yahushua doesn't exist. They never lived. They didn't go down into Sheol and do this. So it's really interesting that here we are. It's like, there he is. There's no hiding um, Satan in this story. And what is really, as you shared, interesting is that, I don't know if it's his vanity or whatnot, um, that he can't recognize the sun. Yeah. Well, it, it finally made sense to me because I've often long thought about this. I've I've long wondered, you know, this is something like my wife and I have talked about for the last 20 years. Did Satan know Messiah when he was crucifying him, or did he not? Right, it's either or. Either he knew or he didn't. Either he was, he was, uh, either he was, um, hustling everybody to, to kill the Messiah, or he himself was being hustled. And yeah, I, it, it's it's, for me, it's it. Well, it's interesting because he's, as I said earlier tonight, Yahusha called the the jews the sons of satan and now this can be you know you, we can argue about what that means um and I, I do i do agree with people that in that context you can say that either you're the son of satan or the son of yahuwah and he was saying you're not the sons of yahuwah you're the sons of satan but that being said they were speaking on his behalf and so again either satan hustled his own children into deceiving them and killing them, or he was actually speaking for them. And according to this text, they were actually speaking for the father. They were all confused as to who he was, and they did not come to knowledge as to who he was until after Satan came to knowledge as to who he was. Like I don't know if anyone caught that. You know, the, the last chapter is like, oh, they confess privately to, to Pilate. Yeah, we we think we did we did uh, put him down. Um, and he was who he said he was. And that's only after Satan the figured that out. Because they don't have the eyes to see. Now, speaking of Gnostic Gospels, I did uh, mention, I didn't actually, I didn't quote from it, but I brought up the Gospel of Bartholomew, also known as the Questions of Bartholomew, which I really like. And that is um, a big disclaimer, like it's given whenever you read it. Like you can't go into any website and they say, oh, this is a Gnostic Gospel. So I was looking up, okay, well, what is it about this book, the Gospel of Bartholomew, that is Gnostic? And I could kind of see it. I'm like looking at it, okay, but the, the, main, the main reason they say it is because Bartholomew asks Yahusha a question, and he gives him a private answer. And so these are seen as, you know, these private revelations are seen as, as Gnostic. Uh, you know, that these, that 
it, it's kind of guiding you like Bartholomew that you you can receive this private revelation, right? And we know that there are no private interpretations of scripture. Um, the thing is, though, that the problem I have with that is that if some of these scholars are going to use that to define Gnosticism, we have a problem because the Gospels then are Gnostic. Because he does the same thing. He doesn't give, um, he doesn't tell the crowds, he gives them enigmas and puzzles that they can't understand. And then he goes and gives a private interpretation to his disciples. Uh, we see that we see that uh, repeated pattern that his disciples were being received. They were receiving private interpretations about the kingdom um, from the, the Messiah. So I, I think that that's not necessarily the best qualification for something that would be Gnostic. That's a great point because he's he, he Messiah is given giving them this this. Uh, quote secret knowledge or explaining these parables to them so yeah i would agree yeah and in fact um this i think uh josh had asked this question like three or four months ago and i'm just now getting back to you josh because you brought up that question about about why would he actually not tell the um the you know the jews why would he not tell them the truth of the kingdom why would he darken their eyes well, I was reading it. I wish I had it in front of me. It would take me a few minutes to pull up the notes. But I was doing a study on Isaiah, uh, the, the, the book of Isaiah. And he says, Yahuwah says in there that uh, this verdict has been made in heaven. And this, this judgment is coming. And you have to keep this knowledge from them. You can't tell them because if they repent, then this judgment made in heaven will be void. And so we see these, we do see occasions where he will actually withhold uh, the mysteries of heaven from people, uh, the knowledge of the kingdom from the people, um, in order that his judgment um, be fulfilled, because it's been written down and he can't go against what has been ordained or written down in heaven. Um, so that, that seems to be that while he was on earth, with the uh, the tribe of Yahudim, the the Yahudim, with Judah, that there was a sentence that was declared on them that he was he was unwilling that the leaders of of Judah should repent. There seems to be that um, case being made, and why he would only give private interpretations to those who he was coming to save. So, so on that interesting on that note, Noel. Um, I don't know who I was having this conversation with, but there's just been this trend where people are like, oh yeah, you know, if we all band together and, you know, follow Trump <laughs> and Q, <laughs> that we can like, uh, you know, delay, um, the revelation prophecies, um, you know, to, quote unquote, to save more people. And it's just like, they're, I keep saying like, there's what timelines. Is that? Oh man, that's some. That's some. Uh, that's some uh, but hey, yeah, people think a lot of different things, and we got to remember, even with these so-called conspiracies, people um, paint a broad brush over them. And what's interesting, and when you go to all of them, and it's like many of them, no, it ain't Trump. Trump even said God. Trump pointed to God. Trump pointed to the man upstairs, and so that's what's interesting there. So people want to give um, disparaging words, like to Paul, let's step back, let's see the play, let's see it going out, and let's listen to some words. And even though we, we don't know who's, this is all in the Father's hands. It's his plan. And what's interesting is this, is that you see down in Sheol, the, the guy who was in charge down there, he didn't... Um, Satan was, he wasn't afraid of Satan. He was basically telling Satan to get the heck out of here anyway. So what we're looking at here, he isn't as much control of his, even though he has no love for, for his minions. The minions really don't have much love for him either because they know the, the end result. He loses. They lose. God wins. So what's interesting in all of this when we bring in the so-called, um, whether it's the military whether it's the um, 
secret agencies, this one, that one, or the other, what's so-called going on behind the scenes. Let's take it back and bring it to, yep, these are all the, the world stage. And let's not disparage people because they, they, they might in some way show an allegiance to a certain party or people without asking them their faith first. Because what's interesting in this also is, I bet you, just like Flat Earth, just like these others, God's hand is in a lot of this, and he uses whether it was his plans or the devil's plans, He's as this was shown in, in tonight's reading, God's Father's going to use it for his will. He's going to, even, even if it's even the work of the devil, he's still going to use that for his purpose. And so in all of this, people aren't looking at the government for savior. They're all, they know ultimately who it is. It's the father. And so that's what's interesting about a lot of these, um, wh where it gets a bad name, is because part of it is most, a lot of these people are God-fearing, God-loving people. Okay, I don't so, think that was quite we, the point that I was trying to express, which is totally okay. Good point, Mike. Um, but I'm more like, so, so no, you would be of the opinion that like times are appointed, like the Revelation 12 sign is something that's actually like that. You, there's no flexibility, like the times are laid out, the days are laid out. It seems like there's a timeline for things. And even in this case, like your, your point just kind of mentioned that, you know, he had to uh, almost live, live by certain rules to not, to, to not violate what needed to happen. The course of events, right? Yeah, I, I think I agree with you on that too, and that's the beauty of it. We keep reading into his this story, and we're like, God has it, Dad has his, the Father has his appointed times and place, just like the hour of our death, just like our last breath. He also has this greatest story that we don't know, but what we do sense is that time is now. That really those what you're saying, and that they can't be moved. They're not moved, and we're seeing that. Yeah, let me, um, I'm going to talk about that really quickly, uh, Mike and Josh, but let me, for all the people here who do want to leave, it's 1120, and I think I, you know, really tried people's patience tonight with that long read. Uh, so let me just close on a prayer real quick, and then anybody who needs to go, can go and whoever would like to stay can stay. This is, once again, I opened with uh, Odes of Solomon, chapter th uh, 3. This is Odes of Solomon 13, and this is a really just a beautiful little uh one two three four liner four lines on 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 torah all right and hopefully this is all of our hearts so behold yahuwah is our mirror open your eyes and see them in him and learn the matter of your face then declare praises to his ruach and wipe the paint from your face and love his holiness and put it on then you will be unblemished at all times with him. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. With that, um, thank you everyone for coming. I'm, I'm just I'm always, again, I'm always amazed that people want to come by and just talk. So, all right. So let's see. What was I, what were we talking about? We were talking about. Um, well, we we're talking about the, the appointed times. And what's yes, interesting okay. is that uh, many of the things we realize already happened that's why we know that he keeps his word that he can't be and this is why it's interesting now because we're like well what is the marker we just know though until it happens we're supposed to um uh you know do his will yeah um I do. Uh, yeah, that to answer your question, I I do believe that there are appointed times, and that, um, in a way, you know, it's, it, you know, part of we we know that Satan is hustling everybody, but like I pointed out tonight, that ultimately, in a way, like Yahuwah is actually hustling Satan and using it all for his glory and and bring it all to you know the perfect perfect time so 
I do believe that Satan is trying to delay uh, and give himself as much time as possible. But uh, yeah, I, I think that we're all. And oh yeah, I was going to say that it's it's interesting. And, and Dave is actually. I think he just left the room. Uh, he's had the observation in the past, and I fully agree with him that when you look all through history, like scriptural history, wherever people were at, they always seem to have a really good understanding of the time, for the most part. Like even when it was leading up to the flood, um, you 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 get books like uh, the Book of the Giants, and the giants are sitting around, and they're like, "Guys, who's going to destroy this whole world in a flood?" Like they all knew it, and the point of that book was that. You know, they, they went and got Enoch, and they're like, Enoch, can you be an advocate to the Father on our behalf and try to bring back the floods? Enoch goes to heaven, he comes back, and he says, all right, this is what the Most High says. He says, if you repent, he will he will turn away the floodwaters. And they all go, and all the giants sit around and go, nah, not worth it. And they don't repent, the floodwaters come. And, and it's the same way with, um, you know, leading into the time of Mashiach. Everybody knew that was the time of Mashiach. They, they all knew. They, they still rebelled because it was determined that they would. And and so thou, you know, post-mud flood, if you look at like the last 200 years, I have letters, uh, a letter from my third great-grandfather. Uh, I no longer have it in my possession, but I have held it in my hand and read it. Um, and I have copies of them where he is writing. He's in the Union in the Civil War. Uh, he was a blacksmith in the cavalry, and he's writing to his um, his daughter, my second great grandmother. Her name was Sarah, and talking about how these are the end times. Like you know, uh, Jesus is returning at any minute. He doesn't know how it can go on. Everything is so bad, and even then, they have the sense that it was the end times. But if you think about it contextually, in the last two hundred years, these have been the end times. And I think everybody across the earth, across this motionless plane, we all have this idea. So a lot of people are in denial of it. Um, but we have this idea like, yeah, it's, it's, we don't know exactly when, what hour, what day, what month, but it's coming quickly like a freight train. And we are in the, the last days. And so people as a whole, um, I think, have an understanding of what hour we're in, that these days, these times are appointed. So... That's that's my belief. What's interesting, a lot of um, let's say spiritual or more new age, um, they call it the ascension. Um, what other words? Uh, the event, um, the flash. So many people who are not, let's say, with different belief systems, are being shown the same thing and then getting interpreted in their own ways. But it describing the same thing which is i think um really interesting and it's not a negative it's a positive to see that okay you're interpreting it like this but you're seeing this uh, monumental change upon us and many of them are seeing it like like um we are that this is a good thing this is the great thing this is the thing we've been waiting for we were actually created for yeah. Yeah, I, I often think about that line from. Uh, forgive me, guys, for bringing up Lord of the Rings, but I often think of that really good line in there where, you know, Frodo says, "Like, I wish this ring had never come to me. I, I wish I had never lived to see these times." And and Gandalf replies, uh, "So do all who live to see such times." And in, in a way, though, I I. Um, a lot of people have that sentiment uh, that they wish they didn't live in these times, but I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really excited that we live in these times. I, I'm really excited that Yah has chosen me of all the generations. Yeah. I, I like, I'm like the last, we're, we are the last to show up at the party. Like in all of human history, if, if, if human history is like this table that is being set for this big banquet and all the invitations are going out, we're the last. But, like there's a few seats left, and we're filling in the last of them at the very, very end of the table. Uh, but he has chosen us for whatever reason. We were chosen to be our ruach to be born at the end of time. He has chosen us to, to for this great uh, revealing, and here we are because we are listening to the Father and what He has to say, and He is revealing all these truths to us. And I am so I don't know about you guys like. 
I am so glad I wasn't born 50, uh, 50 years earlier or 100 years earlier and just totally blinded and just totally in the system and living in my suburban house with my, you know, mowing my green lawn, you know, just like, you know, paying my taxes, just, you know, living that, that, I don't know what, what, what they call the American dream. Like that sounds like a nightmare to me. And I, I love these days that we live in. And I, it, even if I, you know, have to be beheaded and I, you know, going to meet my search and death and then the next year or two, which seems very likely at this rate, um, it, it was all worth it just to, to come to this truth and to know, uh, to know the name of, of our father, like how many past generations didn't even know his name. They had no, he was just the Lord. Just, that's all he was. You know, they're just Jesus. Like they didn't even know his name. And so I feel, I, I'm so grateful that uh, we have been chosen just, just to, to live a life and know what his name is. That's, that's a gift well, do in you and of see itself. It, oh, do you see it? Like, cause you just said something that I've like said for many years and it's like, we will be sitting at his table. And I don't just say this figuratively. I really get that feeling again, like a family table. And I think it's a big one, but we're going to be sitting there. Uh, yeah, going back into the the Ruach HaKodesh discussion, which uh, Rob and Michael will be bringing, up, uh, bringing to our attention next week. I can't wait uh, for their presentation. That was the, one of the things that really stuck out to me was, um, I think it's Proverbs 8 where the the ruach is talking and she's she's actually describing herself like a homemaker um uh, where she is actually like you, you you okay back up like we know that the the parable yahusha told about the father giving the feast and you know he sends out the prophets and then the prophets are put to death and then he finally sends out his son and his son is put to death uh but he's trying to invite everybody into this great banquet you know this 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 wedding feast and and so you see the the ruach hakadesh in heaven and she's like the the homemaker where she's trying to get all the servants to like you know put out the plates and the the choices meats and make sure everything's spick and span and the silverware and the flowers and everything. And so yeah, I think that there is a you see the whole family, the father sending out the invites, the ruach's getting it all ready, the son is sent out to to try to bring the sheep in, the, you know, the lost tribe of Israel. And uh, yeah, uh, there's going to be a a, a a a feast of the ages. And even if we have missed some of that feast in the millennial kingdom. Uh, like it, we still have all eternity. It's gonna be awesome. I can't wait. I can't wait to, yeah, just have the opportunity to 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 dine with some of these amazing set apart people. And I, I read their stories in scripture, and I feel so unworthy. Like I go, like these people were, like had some incredible faith, uh, faithfulness in the Most High. And I, I mean, I look at my life, and I'm just like, wow, that I I can't even measure up to these guys. So I'll just, just to be able to be in the room with them and dine with them will be a huge pleasure. Noel, can I ask you about the millennial thing? Uh, this is a very new concept to me, and I only came upon it from reading on your in, in articles we write. But yeah, because I've read things out of order and, you know, searching back and forth and then Try, you know, and, and I'm still trying to find the ones that I've missed. Could you just kind of explain what you think happened? I, you know, I'm not sure. holding you to anything, but just, just kind of where you're at thinking about this, I, because I'm very okay. curious. So, so this has come from two separate directions. Uh, a lot of times when you read things in scripture, um, and you believe you you're kind of coming to a conclusion on something, but you don't really know how it works into history. And one of the problems with history is that we actually allow history to inform our theology way more than we realize. And history itself may be one big lie. That's a huge problem. So I started years ago, I was struggling with this idea that I would read in scripture, like in the New Testament, that it was all written in haste. You know, the writers are sitting down saying, Yahusha is coming back any moment for our generation. He's coming for us. Like, we will be the generation. This is the end days. Um, one of the, 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 the biggest arguments I use that 
the entire New Testament was written before 70 AD is that nobody once ever brings up the destruction of the temple. That would have been huge. If the temple was destroyed and they're still writing the Bible, they would say, see, see, Yahushua prophesied this and it came true. They actually put that in there like it's it's a... Um, on this fact that it hadn't happened yet. There's a tension there. And and Yahushua said that, uh, he said that there were people standing in front of him who wouldn't taste death until all these things that he spoke about came to pass. Um, you know, he, he told his own disciples, he said, you will not flee to every city in Judea before I come back for you. He didn't say uh, some future generation will not flee to every city until I come back for them. That would be pointless to say that. He said he said that to his disciples. He said to the the people, uh, the the elders of the law who put him down, the the, the Pharisees and the scribes. He said um, he said you will see me at my father's right hand, coming in glory. And so you you get this idea like Yahusha is coming to judge that generation as a prophet, uh, and he's saying this is all about to go down. And so. And so I didn't really have context for that. I didn't really know, like, what do I make of all this stuff? Because clearly, 2,000 years later, and it hasn't happened, right? Or has it, right? And so um, my, my, uh, on that end, um, I, am, I am saying that all those things did happen and that he did precisely what he said he would do, that uh, he came back and he grabbed his disciples and his people. He took them out of there. They did not taste death. Um, and by 70 AD that, you know, everything went down the destruction of Jerusalem. That was, that was the end of the end. Okay. Now let's fast forward to present times. And this is where the mud flood comes in. And then I'm going to fill in the, the middle ground. Okay. So we have 70 AD. I am advocating that Yahushua did everything. The whole Bible was written. He did everything he said he would do, um, by that time. 70 AD. And then about, about the year 1800, um, we come up to what we call the mud flood or a series of events of, you know, this great reset, um, that there was this mud flood event that um, I could take you to any city in the world. Um, here I live in the city of Charleston. Um, is there anyone in this room who went with me on my little field trip to Charleston? I don't think so. I took a, a group, my Sabbath group down to Charleston, and we all saw it for ourselves that the city of Charleston, keep in mind, this is the city that, according to official history, started both American revolutions, started the War of 1776 and the American Civil War. Um, my my neighbors, the house I'm sitting at now, I'm I live on an old um, rice plantation. My neighbors is, according to official history, the oldest home in South Carolina. So just let that sink in. So I'm surrounded by a lot of history, and I could prove to you that the city of Charleston is buried under 12 feet of of mud of debris. I could take you just south of here to the city of Savannah. And the city of Savannah is even worse. That city is so buried, it's not even funny. It's so obvious. Like that whole city was buried by anywhere from 12 to 20 feet in mud. Interestingly enough, these are the two cities that uh, that Sherman did not burn down during the Civil War. They were a gift to Lincoln. Uh, Savannah was Lincoln's Christmas gift, according to the official narrative. Um, I can take you to any ancient, any old city in America, in Europe, um, probably Africa, probably Asia. I could probably even Australia, New Zealand. I could take you to any of these places and show you that the entire world is buried under about 15, uh, 12 to 15 to 20 feet of mud. And why is none of this written in the history books, right? All right. So I, I don't know how much you've done research on the mud flood, uh, but the idea is, is that all of history is a lie. Um, they're lying to us all about all of this. And these, what we see all over the earth is this one world government. Um, we see, like, you go to all the, the, the state capital buildings in America, like, you know, uh, the capital of Texas, capital of Colorado, Col uh, capital city, Sacramento, um, in California. And you see these big, beautiful domed buildings with Corinthian pillars. And according to the official narrative, cowboys and horseback built these things. We have no blueprints. We have no photos of the construction. Uh, we have nothing that shows why they were built or by who or who funded it. And 
we have this all over on every, you know, I, I, I was living in Europe and I saw these big, beautiful buildings and none of it can be explained. And it gets even worse than that because the research is showing that the people who lived in these places apparently didn't poop. They apparently didn't pee. They apparently didn't eat food. Um, you know, they apparently didn't need heat. There's like a really weird things that go on in these ancient homes. Um, and so my, what I'm saying is, is that I'm theorizing that between 70 AD at some point and between 1800, there was the, the physical reign of Messiah on this earth, the millennial kingdom, that it actually happened as prophesied in scripture. It all went down. And I'll give you more of the timeline in just a minute. And, and then um, starting at about 1800, 1812, the whereabouts, the year is really irrelevant. It could have been 1850, 1750, 1900. I have no clue. It's all irrelevant. But at some point in the last 200 years, um, the, um, the, the mud flood happened, and that is when Satan was released from prison. It's when the watchers in the Book of Enoch were prophesied to be released. I believe they were all released together or in, in the whereabouts at the same time, and that they are now ruling over the earth. The Book of Enoch talks about how when the watchers will be released, they will be able to trample over the, the, the homes of the righteous, but they will not be able to take the camp of Yah. Revelation says the same thing, that Satan goes about to deceive the whole world, but he's not able to deceive, he's not able to take the camp of Yah. So Messiah, according to this theory, Messiah still reigns. The millennial kingdom has not come to an, uh, the kingdom has not come to its end, but it's the, the camp of Yah, which we don't know where that is. Satan is surrounded. He is deceived. If you can think of any other time in human history when Satan is, when everything is a lie. Like we're being lied to about everything, germ theory, the atomic bomb, Zionism, the Holocaust, like, you know, space, the, the globe earth, it's all a lie, right? And that's what I, I believe we are living in Revelation 20 right now. Um, we are, we are, the only thing we're waiting on is that I can see is the coming down in New Jerusalem, which will spark the, you know, the, 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 the ferment will be opened up, fire will come down, judgment on the earth. So, so go back to 70 AD. So hopefully this isn't too confusing. According to Enoch's 10-week prophecy, Enoch gives a whole history of the world in 10 weeks. If you can imagine a week is seven days, which this goes against, I'm sorry, any lunar Sabbath people in here. Uh, his, his calendar is a succession of seven, 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 seven. Um, and that's how I see all weeks played out in scripture. Um, so... According to his 10-week calendar, um, each of each week is about 700 years. And you can take, you can follow up, and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to mess this up a little bit, but I think maybe Yahusha arrives in like the fifth week. Um, it's somewhere in there. Maybe it's the sixth week, uh, like 5,500 years. Um, and when, when he ascends to heaven and the temple is destroyed, Enoch says that there is one more week of apostasy, which means we're looking at another 700 years. So there's another, I believe there was 700 more years after 70 AD, the week of apostasy. And this is when Rome is ruling on the earth, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. Interestingly enough, that would take us up to about 700 to 880, which is precisely when the Middle Ages begin. Rome falls, according to the official history. Rome falls, the Middle Ages begin. The, the Dark Ages is, in your Orwellian language, is um is ex it, it, it's basically saying the light age right the the age of messiah is the dark age um i think that that's when it was ushered in and there was about a thousand years um uh, we're i'm actually working with dave on that and we think maybe it only lasted 400 years um of pure righteousness and then there were 600 years of sin uh in which case then the whole thing collapsed um and that's coming from second ezra but anyways uh, that's kind of, in a nutshell, what I believe, what I'm looking at. Um, I don't want to base a whole like church doctrine, like a, you know, creating my own denomination based on this. But um, it, it, everything. The more I'm looking into this, I mean, I'm 100% convinced that the mud flood happened. And the only thing that I can see that fits into this uh, world, what, what we call the Tartarian Empire. 
Uh, initially in FLC Tartaria, where we get that word Tartarus, right? That's where the children of the Watchers went. I actually think Tartar Tartaria is a another Orwellian kind of language. Um, it's just another psyop within a psyop, and it's the Watchers actually, you know, calling the Millennial Kingdom uh, the place where their children went in the deepest, darkest pit of hell, uh, Tartar uh, Tartarus. So that's that's what I'm looking at. Um, and hopefully that didn't freak you out. No, it actually goes right. You know, because I, I've never been able to make sense of Revelation and the timeline, the way it jumps around. And plus, I was raised in a cult and a lot of erroneous teaching anyway. So I could never figure out the millennial reign and how that was supposed to fit in. Is it a first coming? I mean, I mean, were there two comings? Were there three comings of? of well, okay. You, yeah, that, you know, that's a good... I, I, what you're saying actually makes sense because I have watched probably 15 hours at least at this point in the last two weeks documentaries about uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, you, you know, the star fortresses and and all the architecture. How it's all, you know, resonating coil, uh, resonators and coils and antenna and repurposed buildings. And they all look alike no matter where you go. The, exactly what you were saying. Yeah, so I, I totally understand. I, I am, I'm convinced something happened. Um, well, I'm definitely and, convinced something happened. <laughs> That's and it. we can't something build happened. those sort of buildings. And, and I, I have not believed that this that this is the most technologically advanced society. I think we are backwards and using dirty energy where clean energy exists. You know, so what you're saying actually kind of clears things up for me as opposed to confusing me. Um. But where, what, where did he, if, if he reigned for a 400 years, a thousand years, excuse me, did he just go back up into heaven until he comes back no. to destroy it? Well, well the I idea, don't understand that. Right. The idea of the Davidic kingdom is that it's forever. Um, once it comes, it's forever. And so... Um, that's, that's where it gets a little sticky because we know that according to Revelation 20, that at the end of the thousand years, when Satan is released, that he goes about the whole world deceiving everybody, but he is not able to take over the camp of Yah. So we have to ask the question, where is the camp of Yah? It means that the camp of Yah is still on this earth. Now, According to the you know the flat Earth back in 2015 when the movement was really taking off 2015 2016 what are we all saying they're saying well the reason that they're hiding the shape of the Earth is to hide the Creator well the reason they're they're uh, hiding true history is to because they don't want us to know his story they're hiding Yahusha it, it, it so we've all we all spent our time looking at Antarctica and going well we think they're hiding the firmament which I believe they are. But what are they hiding in, in the North Pole? Um, you know, there, there's another really interesting thing that's coming to our attention now. And it's uh, this, this what we call the moon map or the Prague clock and other things. And a lot of you have been probably looking at those uh, things. It's really fascinating because if it's true, the Earth is so large, so vast that everything... Are you talking about the map and, and the map of a tiny portion of the flat earth map it shows on the moon except there's a whole b bunch more yeah if if that is if that is accurate and i'm very willing to say uh to look into that because i believe that uh that the stars and the sun and the moon are our clock it's our sky clock and a map we have scriptural references like in jasher where they would look up into the stars of the sky and they would read the map of the earth uh, we see that with Joseph's brothers, where they're able to ascertain where I think it was where Joseph was, just based on looking up the at the sky. Um, and so, according to that, if that has any legitimacy to it, and I don't know that it does, it means that everything that we know about the known world is just like a sliver. Like it's like we're like literally the outer darkness. I mean, let that sink in. Like, it might be the outer darkness. 
um, that his kingdom might be a whole nother section still still raging on and we're not allowed in it. So, I mean, there's just that a lot to it. All. If, um, like, we're surmising that the Millennial Kingdom was here, that we have many stories of Yahusha all over the all over the earth. We were like, yeah, he was here. Yeah, he was here. Well, then that would make sense. The Millennium Kingdom was here. Because many people go, yeah, but he hasn't come back yet. Which so discounts I'm all these stories. Well, which so here's... We're like, so no, let's he go, did. So let's go with that. And I, uh, and my apologies to any... Uh, I'm not attacking the Lunar Sabbath position. I know there's some Lunar Sabbath people in the room. I'm not attacking the position. However, I do believe that the seventh-day Sabbath is Sabbath. Um, and I believe the Creation Week paints that picture for us. One of the pieces of evidence that I'm looking at um, that, that because people ask me all the time, <clears throat> well, no, if, if, if the mud flood happened, how can you know um, that the, the, the Sabbath, you keep the seventh-day Sabbath, seventh Sabbath is the true Sabbath? And they, that's a very good question. It's the very reason I started looking into the Sabbath debate. And and even before that, they'll take me back to Rome and show me all the different calendars. And I, I'm not even worried. I'm not even concerned about that. Because if the Millennial Re Kingdom happened, the beast was destroyed. That was all set in place. One of the biggest evidences for me that the entire world, guys, the entire world was celebrating Sabbath during the Millennial Reign is that every major uh, language on earth, almost every major language, including those that were untouched by Rome, including Russian and others, uh, like the whole Tartarian region, they all, the seventh day of the week is called Sabbath. Here in, in the English language, which if you listen to my video on the two great beasts uh, post-mud flood, was Great Britain and America. Those, that is the invention of the English language. The English language is a curse. And it, and it, you know, the, if you look at the mud flood uh, research, like Great Britain hijacked the entire history there. But the very fact that all these world, um, these, all these languages across the world honor the Sabbath day in their very naming of the week, that tells me that not so long ago, they were all uh, worshiping Yahua on that day. Now, some people will say I'm crazy and I'm wrong about that. But I think that's evidence for. I think that's evident because that has never made sense to me. Like, why in the world would all these pagan nations observe the Sabbath? Like, the dispersion of Israel does not make that doesn't explain it to me. But if you can understand that the millennial reign did happen on this earth, all of a sudden that makes sense to me, and that is why we can trust that even with the mud flood and the rollout of the people left behind uh, because of their sins that that date was still marked for us in the last 200 years. Like I can know that over the last 200 years, there has been a consistent count of seven, 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 seven. I guess I, I still can't know that hundred percent, but I, I, I feel confident enough with all the world languages out there that, that it's being kept. So. So why the abandoned buildings then? Oh, did everybody get killed or did they go elsewhere? I don't understand all the abandoned buildings. Right. So uh, about two or three weeks ago, um, you could, I guess, look at uh, that video on YouTube called um, Mil uh, Mil 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 Kingdom of Mid Flood and the Wastelands of the Seraphim, um, where I, I go I through all the one. scriptural pass. I go through all the scriptural passages talking about the um, – the, the the warnings during the millennial kingdom not to go out to Babylon. So what happens is is that when he comes in in his judgment, and that's one of the things about the mud flood, uh, we can see a lot of like melted buildings and stuff. Um, I actually think that's that's the destruction of Babylon. If you, it's interesting that in the 1800s, what are they digging out of the sand? Egypt, Babylon, all these places. They were all buried in sand. They were uninhabited, just like the prophecy said that they would be uninhabitable wastelands. And all these prophecies talk about how uh, they would be a haunt of dragons and serpents and, you know, different things like that. Well, what are dragons? They're seraphim, they're angels, they're fallen angels. And so I, I gave a big presentation on what happens if you tell people not to do something. They're going to do it. 
And so these people during the millennial reign, they're going to go out to these wastelands. They're going to go out to Babylon. They're going to go and they're going to start learning about the religion of the watchers. They're going to start bringing them in. Well, Torah tells us what to do if people come into our camps under Torah obedience and preaching preaching other gods. They're supposed to be put to death. But somewhere along the, the line, the, the millennial kingdom starts to crumble um, because these people are coming in and they're they're bringing in the occult knowledge. They're starting to teach sin, this kind of stuff. Um, and eventually, you know, you get to a point so many hundreds of years into it where um, I believe that sin had just, uh, it's just proven mankind is sinful and they're, they're just going to fall into sin. They, people, they, they want the, so during the millennial kingdom, people wanted the, the providence of Yahusha. They wanted his riches and his glory. And they wanted to feel the, the, uh, you know, the effects of that financially and so on and so forth, but they probably didn't want to keep his Torah. They didn't want to go celebrate Passover, Sukkot, these kind of things. They didn't want to keep his feast. Um, they didn't want to keep justice and so on and so forth. And so there came a point when we talk about appointed times, it was appointed after so many generations that Satan would be released and the watchers would be released. And that was a judgment <laughs> on those people. And I believe that we are the descendants um, of of those people who rebelled against the most high. We are the children of those to the fourth or fifth generation that are now waking up. Um, and uh, he's once again, teaching us his ways and revealing his name to us. Um, but so that's why you see these pictures in the 1800s of these big abandoned cities. And you just have people kind of like, you know, like four or five or 10 people walking through like, uh, you know, like not knowing what to do. And, you know, they like in clearly inherited these cities and they're barbarians with these little pickaxes and the hammers with these big, beautiful buildings. And so what, what happened is, is that the, um, as Enoch said, that the watchers would go through and trample the homes of the elect. Um, this is what we see with the world fairs where they, they haul millions of people in the 1890s in front of these world fairs and they systematically destroy them in front of all the people. They're destroying these ancient cities and they're lying to everybody about it. Um, and so what, whatever happened to the set apart, they went to the camp of Yah. I think Yahushua just came and said, okay, guys, we're going to pick up and this has to happen this way and we're going to move over here. I think that's what happened. So... <laughs> I, I still think that I still think that they would be on the earth, and that's one of the great conspiracies that they're being hidden from us. You know, like you look at you look at the um, the 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 Northern Lights, right? If you look at an AE map, the Northern Lights makes a perfect circle over the North Pole. Um, I, I think that that's a I think that's a very good contender for where the Camp of Yah is. It's where the abyss is. It's um, you know, I don't know. So. Uh, Noel, you mentioned this, uh, the whole Sabbath thing, and uh, ironically, I'm not sure if you or if other people in this group. I talked about it in a different group already this week, um, but uh, Mr. Parable of the Vineyard, Adam, put out a video about um, the Tomorrow War. It's it's a it's a new movie or something like this, and um, there's like there's like rapture stuff and there's like Pinocchio stuff and there's like all kinds of different <laughs> symbology. There's also a vaccine plug right at the beginning. Um, nice. Which nice. Is, which is always great, and it's done by a child too, like a really young child. So that's always good you, symbol. Sim, you symbol, gotta symbol. you gotta milk the vaccine. I you, yeah, hundred percent, man. It's because it's you know it's really good for you and stuff, right? So yeah. <laughs> wink, wink, you too. It's really good for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, <it's> always <laughs> definitely get those uh, those those guys there. <laughs> um, so they. The, the whole premise is like the aliens come in the future and then the people go to the past and, and recruit from the past to fight the war in the future. And these aliens, um, they, they, for like for six days, they fight. And then for this on, on the seventh day, they go and they go back to their caves and they don't fight. And they are explaining this to these, to these but guys and they say, yeah, we call it their Sabbath. And so, it kind of like hit you. It's like, is this predictive programming for like, it, like aliens or evil or the enemy being Sabbath keepers? Because I mean, scripture does say the Sabbath is the mark is a, one of the marks of Yah. Yeah. I think Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel chapter nine. Yeah. So it was, when I yeah, saw I that in the, the video, I was just like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is like, 
are they really just uh, playing it like this? Is this how they're going to do it? <laughs> yeah, at the least they're giving a bad name to, yeah. They're trying to put a bad name on, yeah, at the least. In predictive programming, I go back to, yeah, how much more is going to happen? Like in those cards are being shown, like whether it's the, um, the alien deception finally in our myths that they're going to, you know, walking around with us, we're going to finally have that one. Or, again, these are the ones that they, we got to remember the enemy's plans. And we got to remember the father's plans. Doesn't mean he allows those to happen. And so in this, I'm not like a lot of these Hollywood movies and a lot of these things, like it's going to be the zombie apocalypse. And we can look at it in another way and go, it kind of already is the zombie apocalypse. Everyone on their phone or, or in whatnot in other ways, brainwashed. So we don't have to see it as much as it's been um, portrayed in the movies because a lot of it, I, I think it, what it wants to do is repeat the narrative because they ain't got nothing new. And we got to remember to keep our eyes on the father. And one of the things is what we're seeing is, again, the end, where there's something like, and I mean, I don't mean the end in a in a bad way. I mean, the, they played their cards. They ain't got no more cards to play. I'm like, yeah, if you guys were really going to do that, you would have already done it. I think the father held your hand and isn't going to allow um, certain things to happen to that, like what we see maybe portrayed in Hollywood. Um, and again, depends on the neighborhood you live in because some neighborhoods are hell on earth. Let's not, 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 let's not forget, there is, we don't have to um, um, think that it isn't. There is places where it's war. There is cities that in neighborhoods, let's just put it in neighborhoods, that ain't, the, let's to put it politely, aren't the kindest in the world. So we don't need hell everywhere on earth. God, the Father isn't, this is where I see Father's hand in it, that he's staying. He's not going to, and, and maybe this called me wishful thinking, prayer, um, uh, um, hopeful thinking. But one of the things by, see, by by looking at like a lot of these movies, predictive programming, these dooms, doomsday, I think that's what they like to do. Really what they like to do. And the father is revealing that. It doesn't mean that he's going to allow it. What, what do you mean you don't think he's going to allow it? Like, there's a lot of stuff he's because definitely going to allow. a lot of it, allow, already happened. Or ordain, actually. I think actually. a lot of it already happened. A lot of that really, what we want to say, um, would people go back into the tribulation, the tribulation times. So that was really when, like, let's say the worst happened. We got it pretty bad now. But if really if that worst already happened, I'm looking at it today going, hey, man, quick are we follow the father's will and it's soon it doesn't need to come to that um um destruction yeah I'm well saying. i mean i don't think it has Hasatan to. is literally building an army from what i can tell he's building oh, yes, an army and he's not gonna that. let you or me or noel or anybody else get away with not being a part of it so it's it it it's definitely gonna get the worst I would, <laughs> I would hazard that it could I, I, get no, the worst. No, we can rebuke him <laughs> if we all have the power to rebuke him, right? That that shows us that hey. But you might be fine. Not to say we're right? more powerful than him. That's not the. That's not what makes things hard. What makes things hard is when your close family members don't, and when they fall or when they, you know, get the cookies. Yeah, we've already seen this, correct? We've already seen this. So. And that's where I'm like, I call it the grace, call it mercy, Father's mercy. And if we've already seen this happen, I'm like, like Noel says, well, where could it go in the years if we, if we, if there's years to come? We could see, yeah, they want to chop our heads off. That happens in some places right now. Now, all I'm saying is this is, yeah, I see Satan's plans. I see what he'd like to do with us. I'd see Father's plans, and I'd see what's possible for us. I don't know. Call me wishful thinking, but um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to live on hell on earth. <laughs> I'm just saying, 
Because that, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, it's it's not necessary proph- prophesize that we have to go that. What I'm saying that evil will have its way that bad. Okay, can I can I throw I something it, at? I think it already did. Can I throw something at you guys? So, getting back to the the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom. If it did happen, we should see some residue of it. Now, one of the things I've argued tonight is that the the fact that every major language on Earth says Sabbath on the seventh day, we say Sat Saturday, Saturn's day here in English, but that is res that is residue, I believe, potentially of the Millennial Kingdom. Well, here's something else I've been reading. I've been sharing this with um, with Dave and the the Odes of Solomon. I read two of them tonight, actually three of them, but. Uh, I've been reading through these and I've been really taken back because the Odes of Solomon, uh, I'm reading some of these thinking these could, this could be residue. These appear to have been written by somebody uh, like O29 here I pasted in the room. The guy who wrote this appears to have already resurrected from the dead and wrote in with Messiah and conquered the earth. Okay, so let me just read this to you guys and tell me if I'm off my rocker. Because I'm reading a lot of these odes and they don't make sense unless if you put yourself in this position. All right. Yahuwah, or the Lord, is my hope. I shall not be ashamed of him. For according to his praise, he made me. And according to his grace, even so, he gave to me. And according to his mercy, he exalted me. And according to his great honor, he lifted me up. And he caused me to ascend from the depths of Sheol. And from the mouth of death, he drew me. So this is what we were reading about tonight, okay? So this guy, and you'll see here, this is not the Messiah talking. The guy who wrote this is somebody who resurrected from the dead. He came out of Sheol. Okay, and he caused me to ascend up from the death of Sheol, and from the mouth of death, he drew me. And I humbled my enemies, and he justified me by his grace. For I believed in Yahuwah's Messiah and considered that he is Adonai. And he revealed to me his sign, and he led me by his light. Here's where it gets really interesting. So he's already resurrected from the dead. Now look at this. And he gave me the scepter of his power, that I might subdue the devices of the people and humble the power of the mighty, to make war by his word, and to take victory by his power. And Yahuwah overthrew my enemy by his word, and he became like the dust with which a breeze carries off. Past tense, guys. And I gave praise to the Most High because he has magnified his servant and the son of his maidservant. Hallelujah. All right. So I read that. I'm reading these. I'm going through these. I'm going, okay, all these guys who are writing these odes have resurrected from the dead. They've been in Sheol. They are now given the scepter of the Messiah to go and conquer the earth with him. And all their enemies have been subdued. And so I, I'm just, I don't know. I, 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 I actually think this. This, I know this sounds like crazy talk to some people because now I'm taking this like the next step. But here I think we actually have a uh, residue that th- there's a reason why these odes haven't been proclaimed much in the church. They don't make sense to anybody. You're like, what? Um, so that just wanted to throw that out there for you guys to think about. I actually am thinking about doing a whole uh, presentation one night just on these odes and uh, showing people um, that. So what was beautiful anyway. in, in that ode is it showed the power that Love it. that the Father has and what will he has for us to do. We don't have to succumb to the evil of this world. We can stand. And like I said, it doesn't mean that they're, they're going to have their way with us. They might, you know, take a knee, a real one, to the Father, not this, you know, the one playing out in the um, sports arenas. Yeah, let me see. Um, <laughs> hold on. I, there's another one that is like you read this and you're like, you know, that whole presentation I gave on how uh, the beast is returning um, that didn't really go over well with some people. But um, let me see if I can find this. Hey, while well, Noel's finding that, I'm okay. going to go ahead and sign off uh, real quick. I just wanted to let everybody know it's uh, Eastern time. It's after midnight. So just to let you know what time it was, I don't know if some of you lost your clock, but uh, I'm taking off. So God bless you guys. See you later. Shalom. Shalom. Okay, I'm going to... Shalom, Shalom, Polly. Yeah, Shalom, Polly. 
When I'm reminded read- that this is a spiritual battle, right? I'm not fearing, okay, like Noel was saying, Noel's like, man, if this happens, he's not fearing it. He's, I'm, I'm, I'm home. I'm back with the Father when this happens. So something that I'm, I'm reminded of is that we can literally cast these demons out of people, cast this stuff out of people, and that's maybe what's to come instead of, you know, this death and destruction, we all become zombies, that finally, you know, we stand with the Father and he gives us this power to pray for the people and we see miracles. So you guys can read... O twenty two here. I'll just go through O twenty two real quick. But there's one line in there I really want you guys to pick up on. It's all past tense. Okay, think of the book of Revelation. All right, he who caused me to descend from on high and to ascend from the regions below. So, all right, he, uh, or ascend from the regions below, past death, and he who gathers what is in the middle and throws them to me. He who scattered my enemies and my adversaries, conquests of the earth. He who gave uh, me authority over bonds so that I might unbind them. Here's the, here's the line I want you guys to really think about. He who overthrew by my hands the dragon with seven heads and set me at his roots that I might destroy his seed, the seed of the serpent. You were there and helped me. And in, so past tense, you were there and helped me do this task. And in every place, your name surrounded me. Your right hand destroyed his evil venom. The dragon is destroyed. And your hand leveled the way for those who believe in you. And it chose them from the graves and separated them from the dead ones. So this is what we read about tonight. They were separated, the dead ones, from the graves. It took dead bones and covered them with flesh, the resurrection. But they were motionless, so it gave them energy for life. Incorruptible was your way and your face. You have brought your world to corruption that everything might be resolved and renewed and the foundation of everything is your rock and upon it you have built your kingdom and it became the dwelling place of the holy ones so this is the last line there and upon it you have built your kingdom and it became the dwelling place of the holy ones so these odes are so provocative and they are describing to me everything that my understanding of the millennial kingdom is so just food for thought and um i'll be digging more into these odes and i I, seriously i think i might do a whole thing on it because uh they're just they're wild so where do these odes come from these are called the well these are called the odes of solomon now according to the official narrative um it, it you know if you kind of I always have to, you know, say wink, wink with what the scholars have to say. Uh, historians and scholars place the odes anywhere from the first century uh, to the late second century, kind of in there. So think of like fifty to seventy A.D. up to like two hundred A.D. Now this is the official narrative, um, and these are considered to be uh, prayers or recitals that the Nazarene or Christians, when they would uh, the Nazarene just means the branches. When Yahushua says, "I am the, bro- the the vine, you are the branches," um, when the, when the believers of Messiah would get together, they would recite these uh, it, kind of in a group, or maybe sing them as songs. Um, and they're they all kind of rehearse different forms of theology. So that's the official uh, interpretation of this. Um, but again, I'm just reading this, going like this. This seems like. It would be really weird for early Christians to be to be, you know, talking about how the dragon has been overthrown, hallelujah, and all evil has been vanquished, and all of our enemies have become dust, and we've all been, you know, resurrected from the. See what I'm saying? Like it's just it's weird. It's weird to take it in that context. It doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, anyways, maybe that's why we've never really heard it. Yeah, you know. I had had a problem for years with the, you know, the King James Bible because it's like, where did this come? You know, and the farther I dug, it was like, you know, I, I know the source of this and it's not anything good. Why would, at that time, I thought of him as God, put put these people in charge of compiling the scriptures that it, that we're going to refer to as the Bible? 
and you know the farther i dug into that that's that's how i came to even find you guys was through doing research about about that and you know i kind of had the sense that some things were scrubbed or changed before i even read what you wrote about that and the fact that there's all these other writings which seem to be quoted in scripture but are not found in what we consider scripture you know i just got my um suffer so you know that's eye opening but how much else is out there that's hiding down you know underneath the vatican in the in the library right now those but are some great points you bring up theme. You know, yeah, what are they now, hiding? I mean, they're hiding stuff from us. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're hiding stuff. Yeah. Now, um, I, I want to point out that you know, when we talk about appointed times and the great contest and how Satan is trying to hustle humanity, but then Yahuwah basically hustles Satan and spins it back on him and all these kind of things happening. It's a very complicated business. Um, I do believe that there are many, many books that are what we call scripture that are not in canon. However, um, I I have come to the conclusion after many years, now I could be wrong, but I, I am currently at the conclusion that the 66 book canon was designed by the Most High. And I see two things happening. One is that Rome created the canon uh, to spin it into their narrative, to control the narrative. All right. But and so it looks like Satan's winning this because uh, I, I see no prophecy whatsoever that Yah would choose uh, the Roman emperors and you know Roman councils to decide what our reading literature is. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. However, we see like in Proverbs where it says that it is the uh, you know the, the honor it is it is the uh, what is it the, it is the right of Yahuwah to conceal a matter and the honor of kings to search it out. And so the idea is, is that we have many books that have been written, but that have been concealed. Uh, Enoch says that it was intended for a later generation, which I believe was actually Yahushua's generation and also ours. Um, Second Ezra says the same thing. Um, and so the idea is, is that, yeah, there are many books that are buried, but Yah has designed it that way so that his children would have to seek them out. Uh, um, that, okay. That those who tr that those who truly love him, um, that we're not just going to go to our pastors and say, "Okay, here's the 66 books uh, canon. Define it for me. Tell me what what I'm supposed to believe." It's like, no, we're going to read it. We're going to seek this stuff out for ourselves. And that's what's exciting about um, when I read, like the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, you know, I, I'll read ten other books that all confirm that. You know, and and you start reading all these books, and they start confirming each other, and you're like, "Wow, this is amazing!" You know, where have you mm -hmm. been all my life? But the, I think it was, always, yeah, I'm being repetitive, but it was designed that way. So okay, I and can accept that for, answer. And, and and for and for and for our generation, it was designed that way for our generation. We are the generation where many things are being revealed. Um, for example, uh, the the. All four Gospels are being translated into Hebrew right now. That's really exciting. Uh, from Hebrew, the, 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 what is it? The Spanish uh, uh, Hebrew Gospels. Uh, so uh, Matthew, Mark, and John have all been translated, and Luke is being translated. I still believe Revelation is out there. Um, I'm hoping that before the end, Revelation is translated into uh, the, the Hebrew text is found. And translated, but I, yeah, I think they're all out there, and they're being unveiled to us um, slowly but surely. You know, like pieces of the puzzle, like you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and and the the Nag Hammadi texts, and all these different things that are slowly coming out little by little. So, no, how, how many pieces of the puzzle do you think are left? I, I'm really like, wow, one or two. I know there's a whole load of mysteries and more, but for what's concerning us. I'm feeling like what, well, like you said, so much has been revealed. <laughs> What's next? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we all came. A lot of us in this room came to the flat Earth around the same time, and that was just like, like, 
blew our minds. We're like, right? Like the most amazing thing ever. Like what? The earth is flat. Like, and it says so in my Bible and it's been in front of my face this entire time. And that was just, you know, that was like, you know, 2015, 2016, 2017, that was like, like a honeymoon with the eye. It was such an incredible time. And then now we all came in a different order. Some people here probably came into Torah first and then flat earth because of the flat earth. I was like, well, what's next? And then I discovered it was right in front of my face the entire time. Boom, Torah. That was the most incredible thing. And and I'm like, well, what could possibly come next? And then, you know, of course, Paul is, you know, argumentative and divisive in here for us. But but then but there's uh, and I still don't know how I feel about that. But then there's there's um, like this whole like mud flood thing. When the mud flood thing happened, that was like, what? And now we're even learning that like that the earth may be lar much larger and it just keeps going. And so um, I don't know what's going to be next. I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine what could possibly be next. Maybe there's nothing next. I don't know. Maybe this is it. But um, I think whatever is next, it's just going to just like, yeah, who is? It's just he keeps revealing. The father keeps revealing things to us. And we keep going deeper and deeper into this. And for anyone who's paying attention and anybody who desires the truth. So no. I couldn't even begin to guess. Yeah. Quick, uh, we, we were talking a little bit about the whole uh, name being written on the wall thing uh, over the last uh, day or two. Um, yeah. And my, my concern with that was that if people are actually expecting, like, the quote-unquote Jesus Christ character to return and to somehow walk through those concreted over gates, and, and yep. somehow they can perform that, whether it be Blue Beam or whether it be, like, you know, some kind of deity or nephilim or fallen angel or satan or whatever that would be a huge event because isn't that yeah. what most christians are expecting that's what yes. they're expecting next you be a little clearer on that story uh, uh, no you can you know a lot more about the history so if you want to take it take it Noel, you kind of know where my thinking is right now well, so. okay, so ho hopefully you guys know my, my conclusions on this, that the Temple Mount is a hoax, that it is not the location of Solomon's or Herod's Temple. Now, if you guys want, I have a whole article on it. I have a two-part podcast or YouTube videos you can look at. The Temple Mount is a hoax, um, which I take you through the whole history. And, and so, so undeniably for me, the temple was located on Mount Zion. Okay, Mount Zion was the city of David. Now, if you go to Wikipedia today, Wikipedia will tell you that they will say this. It is so blatantly in your face. They say, well, yeah, the city of David was Mount Zion, but the location of Mount Zion changed. That when they built the temple, they changed the location of Mount Zion. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't change the location of Mount Zion. Mount Zion was always the city of David. The temple was built there. Guess what, guys? They all know it. The Zionists know it. The Jesuits know it. The Vatican knows it. Um, you know the the the, uh, the Sanhedrin knows it. The the rabbinical Judaism. They all know it. There's a reason why all the archaeolo the most archaeological digs are all being conducted on Mount Zion. They're digging and they're searching there. It's all protected. Meanwhile, the Palestinian Authority owns the Temple Mount. What was the first thing they did when they conquered Jerusalem in 1967? That very day, they handed it over to the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is over there, and they're like, you know, trashing stuff in there. And they're like, oh, no, they're destroying second, you know, temple artifacts. Oh, no, someone stopped them. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> Zionism and Rome would not put up with that. If that truly was the temple, they'd be like, oh, we have no authority over the Palestinians. They're destroying the temple, okay? So if you if you go look anywhere in the world, you go look at in, it, all the way up in Great Britain, all through Europe, just go to Masada, and you could look at what a Roman fort looks like. The Temple Mount is clearly a Roman fort. Okay, It's clearly a Roman fort. They're identical all over the earth. And in fact, if we have to go by human tradition and you know look at a Roman whore, we looked at Josephus, and Jophis, Josephus tells us, he says that in when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the foundations of the temple was destroyed. Nothing remained of the temple. Nothing. The only thing he said remained was the foundation of Fort Antonia. Okay? So the Temple Mount is for Antonia. It was built, it tells us, you can read it in Maccabees, the whole thing. 
There was a bridge that went down from Fort Antonia to the city of David where the temple was. All right. So, so now what we're finding now is that over the gate, there's the, the like they call it the Messiah gate or whatever. And the Islam, uh, and I've been there, you know, multiple times and I've seen it with my own eyes. And Islam has built a cemetery there, you know, to, to block a prophet from walking through those gates uh, because. You know, a prophet cannot go over dead bodies and be unclean and enter the temple. Well, the problem is, the thing is, is that Yahusha already did that, okay? He he already went to the temple. He was selected as the Passover lamb on the 10th of Nisan. When he went into the temple, they threw down the palm branch and said, Hosanna in the highest. Uh, they selected him as their lamb. He went to the temple. It was done. The temple was destroyed. So anyways, now on Fort Antonia... Over that gate, apparently they have found the name of Yahuwah. Now, keep in mind that Herod, uh, anyone could have put that there through history, including King Herod, who did extensive work on Fort Antonia and, and uh, improved upon it. Uh, he, he was catering to the Jews all the time. He could have easily put that name there. I don't know. But it's interesting because now we have this gate where the Messiah is supposed to pass through. Um, and there's the name there. So that's, it, it's interesting. It's interesting that for a setup for a possible Illuminati um, Antichrist. And um, might I just mention that the, the rabbinical Judaism, um, all my research has shown that rabbinical Judaism does not want a temple. It's all a part of the deception, guys. They all say they want a temple. They, you know, Zionism is hinged upon it. They don't actually want a temple. You know why the Pharisees? The rabbinical Judaism is the Pharisees, right? Remember the, the very word rabbinical rabbi, right? And they're coming from the. the they they say their all their traditions come from the Pharisees. The, the the Talmud comes from the oral traditions of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones that sponsored the wars. Now keep in mind, Josephus was a plant. Like, he's so clearly a spook. That guy was working from Rome to begin with. He's the only guy that emerged from a cave in Galilee alive, and he then became, like, Tiberius's, like, in Vespian's, like, best friend. It's like, oh, sure. Yeah, that's exactly how that works. The The, the Pharisees were, uh, they, they, the Pharisees actually wanted to do away with the temple the first time. The reason being is that the Sanhedrin ran the show, and the Levites. They were they were they were the 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 lawyers the the scholars of the Torah. The Pharisees wanted to do away with Torah because they wanted their oral traditions. In fact, they'll say to this day that there is no Torah apart from their oral traditions. They've done away with it. They don't care about the Torah. Just like Christianity, they've bo they've all done away with it. So they actually funded the wars in 70 AD, and according to the official narrative, the uh, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, or whatever what was that, like 130 or whatever. They actually funded those in order to destroy the temple and remove the Sanhedrin. Um, and that's why to this day, I, I continue to say that they do not want a temple. Because if there's a temple, it means they lose control to the Sanhedrin. They don't want the Sanhedrin in control. They don't want the Torah in control. So anyways... Um, uh, that's my long rant there, but I just, it just, I, I just get so irked when I hear all the time, but yay, the temple, we're going to build the temple. Woo. You know, it's like, dude, guys, like, this is like all a deception, like all of it. And amazingly, if you look at that, I actually, uh, my theory on the dome of the rock was that Islam never built it. There is no other building in all of the Mohammedan ling, uh, religion that ever resembles the dome of the rock. However, um, we know two things. Uh, Herodian, the you know the the homosexual emperor who built uh, uh, Herodian um, the wall in England, which I actually got to walk. It was kind of cool. Um, he built two temples to Baal. He built one in Lebanon and one on the uh, on Fort Antonia, and um, they were identical twins. Well, what's interesting is Dome of the Rock is an identical to the Temple of Baal. In Lebanon, so it's like it's so obvious. It's such an like nobody else is getting this. I don't know what why people can't get this that the Dome of the Rock is actually the Temple of Baal built by Herodian, and Constantine never, uh, yeah, Constantine never tore it down. It's so obvious. Anyways, so and I, I talk about all that if you guys ever listen to that podcast or read that article. 
and I, I show you know the, the sleight of hand how it happened. So no, about the temple. So they don't really want a temple. Why are they pushing the whole? Why are they give, paying lip service? What they really would probably rather have is just courts, is my thinking. But why are they pushing this whole temple thing? Or is that just part of the Zion cover up? Yeah, it's 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 the same thing like the atomic bomb and you know the, the the Holocaust hoax and you know the atomic bomb is a hoax, but all these things you know push Zionism, and you know when you get into the truther community, there's the big debate. Well, who's running the world? Is it the Jesuits, the the, the Zionists? I don't have the opinion that Rome is running the world and that uh, the the Zionists are a plant of of Rome, uh, just like in Yahusha's day, they were. The, the the leaders of Israel uh, of Judea were plants of Rome, um, and including the Herodians and so on and so forth. So, um, and in fact, they're actually you know um, I also written a paper on how they're Edomites. They were Edomites in Yahushua's day, but also today that they're, they're Edomites, um, and that's one of the the prophecies that will bring about um, uh, Yahuwah's wrath is that the 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 Edomites who um, we're not supposed to step on, you know, Israel's inheritance or claim it as their own or doing so. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so I, I just think that it's it's all a part of um, the, you know, keeping the lie afloat, right? You got to keep milking it for everything it's worth. You know, it's just, it's so weird that in, in 1967, when they went and conquered Jerusalem, they had the Temple Mount. It was theirs. They, nobody even put up a fight. They just walked up there. And then that very day, they go, oh, you know what? We're going to hand this back to the Palestinians, and for the next fifty years, whatever. Oh, we just, oh, we wish we never did that. Oh, we just want our temple, and it's like, no, you don't. You don't want a temple. They would have, they could have done it right then and there. So, um, but they're just trying to keep the lie afloat and just milk each generation over and it's over a and over again. So, question. it's just a distraction. Yeah, it's a distraction, but it's also psychodrama. You know, it's. I talk a lot about that, but, um, you know, it's, I, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's all, it's all what I call magic. It's all alchemy. It's a psychodrama. It's, it's, it's constantly, right. um, the lies they're feeding us. So the thing is with, um, uh, performance witchcraft. Okay. So performance witchcraft goes all the way back to Babylon. And, um, this is where acting comes from, like in the movies. Um, and, the, the idea of performance witchcraft is that it has to be fake. It can't be real. Um, you're actually selling people an illusion, and that's part of the magic. And the, you get people to uh, survive, feel like they are surviving a situation or living through a situation, and they are feeling emotions because of that, anger, joy, laughter, sorrow, fear, whatever. And that's, that's how it works. And so, yeah, that's why the world is literally a stage and it's all just one lie after the next, after the next, after the next, in order to alchemically change us. Um, that's, you know, that's the big, you've said that, so that's like my big theory. Uh, it goes all the way back to Babylon when I started reading about how the mysteries would enact magic through theater. It's all theater. And that's, we learned that in Babylon. So uh, that's what the Temple Mount is. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a literally a stage. You look at it, it's a stage. Right, the world is a stage, and there's the center stage right there. Um, so that's I. That's the only, I guess, my main explanation for everything. It's magic. Anyways, what were you saying, Lee? You were going to talk. I I had a question. Oh, okay, a question for who? For me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> where Where do you believe the temple that had been leveled is located? And which do do you think it was the building? Well, I guess answer the first. Okay, so if you were to stand on the Mount of Olives, which is to the east of Jerusalem, and you're facing west, you're you're on the Mount of Olives. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Garden of Gethsemane are, is right below you. You go down into the Valley of the Kings, and you're looking at Jerusalem. Okay, if you look to your left. Stage left, you have the city of David. So there is, um, there is, um, uh, I have to look at the article, but in between the, uh, in between Jerusalem, there is the, uh, what is it called? Ah, I can't think of it, but there's like a little kind of like a ledge, like a, a slope. And then you have the city of David. All right. So, um, 
and that that is where the temple was. That is where the uh, Gihon Spring is. It's where the natural springs are. We know that the temple would have had to have been built on top of natural springs. If you go to Israel to this day, you go. You have to go to um, the city of David to go to Hezekiah's tunnel. And I walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. It was, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my young adult life. That's where the temple was. They don't tell you that. Like, so this is the nature of deception. They have a tower there on the city of David where you go and you climb up. And you and they have you look across the valley, and at the Temple Mount, Fort Antonio, and say that's where the temple was. When in fact you're standing right where the temple was. That's the nature of deception. It's incredible. So if you think about wh where's the Valley of Gehinnom, uh, it's right behind the city of David. So if if the if this if Gehenna is supposed to be the the trash, the garbage that doesn't make it in the kingdom, that's tossed out of the temple, it. it if you're putting the temple on Mount da on the city of David on Mount Zion right there, then that puts Gehenna right behind it, and it makes total sense. But if the temple, you know, you, so yeah, maybe that can give you a picture of where it all is. Okay, so no. if that's where you believe it is, my, my next question is: Do you believe that was the First Kings six building or the First Kings seven building? First Kings six or seven. I don't know what the context is of that. I mean, I don't know what the First Kings six versus First Kings seven building. Is. Uh, they're they're two different buildings as far as. Well, okay, maybe you can get back to me on that. Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, we we see that uh, when David uh, conquered the the city of David, uh, Zion, he purchased a threshing floor there, um, and Jerusalem hadn't been conquered yet. Um, if, if, if the temple mount is the threshing floor, which by the way, it is not, it is not shaped like a threshing floor. If you've ever seen a threshing floor, they're flat for threshing where they say the Holy of Holies is, it is like a rock. It's all, it's all curvy and shaped funny. It, it's not a threshing floor. Um, and so it would be really weird if. If he purchased a threshing floor there at the city of David, but it's like a half a mile or a quarter of a mile away over there on that, I don't know. So, um, yeah. Noel, I saw a video just a couple of days ago, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was exactly what you said about where the temple was. And they also say it was not the Temple Mount, and they 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 show where they're literally excavating 30 feet away from where that spring is of Gihon. Uh, what's it called? Yeah. Um, I think it's the Gihon and spring. Gihon Springs. And they have excavated down, they have found where there were, you know, presses where you could, you know, for pressing olives and, you know, for the oil, you know, where they would and rings set in the, uh, places where they were literally set up to slaughter animals and it's 30 feet from the spring and there are, it shows where there were things inset in the rock you know to tie off the animals and they they're excavating all that and it's literally 30 feet you know it's right there the springs and and the tunnel and everything's right there and you now can I find that on youtube are you referring to the? Uh, you're not referring to the Michelle Zedek um, temple, are you? By chance? I don't think so. Okay, all right. I, it, they were claiming it was it was the you know the Solomon's temple. Okay. Or wait, no, no, no. The the not Solomon's temple. The one that was built on. I think they built a set. The second one was built when they came back from captivity, right? Herod's temple, Hezekiah? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that one. No, that Hezekiah one. was before Hezekiah Her. was before their captivity. Um it would have been like, you know, Nehemiah, Ezra, uh um, Oh yeah, I, and I what may was have by Herod. getting my yeah. putting them mixed up. But I saw a video that's that fully supports what you just said. And they they actually show it. I mean the visuals are great. I, I can't remember what it was called, but you know, look up Temple Deception or something like that, and you should be able to okay. find that video. And it's very recent. It's a new video. So the other thing uh, they've discovered, and um, right there 
on the city of David is the original location of the city of Shalom, um, the city of peace. And that's where we know that uh, Noah and his son Shem lived to their, to their dying days, where Meshelzedek lived. And the temple of Meshelzedek has been discovered there at the city of David. Again, not, not Fort Antonia, not where Jerusalem is today, the original city of David, Mount Zion. And it's a a absolutely incredible. Like you go look at it and like you just, they, they found like where they were slaughtering the animals, uh, all clean animals, uh, no unclean animals. They found the wine press. We know that Noah was a winemaker. And I'm, I'm like getting on like nerdy watching this going like, oh man, that's like Noah's wine press. Um, but that, I mean, again, that just, and that again signifies the, the location of the temple was Mount Zion. It was always there. That was always the mountain. I am of the opinion, as you guys know, that the mountain of worship that we hear about in literature from Adam, where Adam's descendants lived on the mountain of worship, that it was Mount Zion, that it was always there. There was always Mount Zion. That was the mountain of worship. That's where Adam and his Seth, the Sethites lived in that little region there um so it's getting late i should get to bed soon is anyone you guys can talk as long as you want but does anyone have anything else they want to throw my way before i i, I turn out for the night that was a great meeting man great great meeting that's great all right well guys i enjoy meeting with you guys every thursday let's do this again we should uh make a habit of it and uh, shalom, everybody. See you. See you around. Shalom. Good night. Shalom. 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 Shalom.